It's a holiday, a day that many Ghanaians will take the opportunity to rest and depart from the usual stresses and strains associated with work. But we'll be serving you uh, the AM show this morning. We're going to start off with the news review and we'll be having a conversation with the, um, the political science scientist at the University of Ghana, Dr. Kwame Asa Asante. is the political scientist at the Center for European Studies. He's going to be our guest on the uh, paper review. Now, when we get into our big stories this morning, the Opposition National Democratic Congress is asking the Electoral Commission to abandon plans to make the Ghana card the sole requirement to get on the voters register. The NDC says that it is seeking to rig the 2024 general election. We'll speak to the Convention's People's Party for their take on this particular uh, issue. Also, remember that the CPP is celebrating Dr. Kwame Nkrumah by holding what it calls the true state of Ghana. We'll hear from officials of the party. Also, today is International Day of Peace. This year's theme is Build Peace. We have a conversation on ethnic nationality-based discrimination and the need for respect of uh, human dignity. Our guest on that particular subject matter will be Thomas Aviapu, the Executive Director uh, for Human Development and the Acting National Director for Caritas Ghana, coordinator of the Sahel Peace Initiative project as well. George Amo is the Executive Secretary of the National Peace Council. He's also going to join us for that particular discourse. Carol, Caroline Hayes is the Head of Programs of the Catholic Relief Services. Now, on Thursday, we we'll would have uh, the Bar Redu Memoria Lecture. The 2022 edition is themed Buying for the Public Good from the Public Press, Redeeming Ghana's Fiscal Sanity in the Asylum of Public Financial Reforms. Today on the show, we we'll would hear from the lead organizer, Dr. Charles Riku Burbe, ahead of that particular event. Now you can get interactive with us throughout the course of the discussions via phone as well as social media in that particular respect. It's now time for the news. Now let's start off with this particularly intriguing story where a pastor is being held by police in Mankasim in the central region after confessing to helping a local chief kidnap, kill and secretly bury a 25-year-old nurse trainee in the body of the student nurse Georgina Asobodre was exhumed by the pastor and the police investigators on Tuesday, September 20, in the room of the Tufuhine of Tufuhin of Ekumfi Akwakrum Nana Crack. Richard Virginia Akun has more in the following report. Anger, shock, disbelief was boldly written on the faces of residents and could be heard in their voices as well as police investigators were led by the pastor to exhume the body of 25-year-old Georgina Asobuki. The chief who also serves as president of the Mankasim Traders Association and the pastor, according to the information gathered by the media, allegedly kidnapped the nurse after engaging in some sexual act with her. After the deeds, the two were said to have killed her and secretly buried her in one of the chief's apartments. The pastor was arrested in Cape Coast and admitted to the crime. He subsequently led the police to the chief's residence where the victim's body was exhumed. Notices surfaced in Mankasim announcing that the victim was missing. The notice read Georgina Butri went for an interview at Cape Coast on Wednesday, and up till now, she cannot be found. Her phone is off. Please, anybody with information about her should call. The victim's body was reportedly buried nearly three weeks ago. Along with the body, the victim's bag, shoes, and other possessions were also found at the chief's house. Residents of Mankasim are requesting that the police ensure that justice is served after expressing their surprise and outrage at the incident. She's a thick, tall lady, someone's beautiful daughter, very beautiful. We heard that someone had been secretly buried here. 
And so we rushed here. It's really painful and heartbreaking. My daughter came to tell me what has happened. And so I want her to always endeavor to sleep early. Investigations by the police led them here to exhume the body. I'm told she was killed and buried about two weeks ago. I don't know where the lady came from, but I can tell you that the mobile phone is a valuable resource. The Mankasim town was thrown into a state of shock, with people trooping to see where the body of the training nurse was secretly buried. The victim's body has been deposited in the mortuary of the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital for preservation and autopsy. Reporting for Joy News, Richard Kwejonya Akon, Cape Coast. Very sad developments there, but away from that, the opposition National Democratic Congress has fired at the Electoral Commission, accusing its chairperson, Jane Mensah, of leading the country on a path that could plunge the country into chaos and violence ahead of the 2024 general election. The EC is set to lay a new constitutional instrument before Parliament, which will outlaw all forms of identification and make the Ghana card the sole requirement to enroll onto the voters' register, according to National Chairman of the NDC, Samuel of Ozuampofu, who spoke at a press conference organized by the party's Council of Elders, the new CI is unconstitutional and therefore will be fiercely rejected. Important matters that threaten the sustenance of our democracy and our very peace as a nation. Ladies and gentlemen, we invited you here today to draw the attention of Ghanaians to how the Electoral Commission is seeking to undermine our democracy through the proposed public election registration of voters instruments. This regulation is a clear, is clear on the face of it that the Ghana card shall be the only proof of identification for purposes of voter registration. The regulation flies in the face of Article 42 of the Constitution, which states as follows. Every citizen of Ghana, 18 years or above, and of signed mind, has the right to vote and is entitled to be registered as a voter for the purpose of public elections and referenda, end of course. This clearly makes the proposed provisions unconstitutional. What it means is that if the CI is passed in its current form, it will not only be unconstitutional, it will radically disenfranchise all those prospective voters who for no fault of this are unable to obtain the national ID card issued by the National Identification Authority. They would have been denied the right provided for them under Article 42 of the 1992 Constitution. Some of us one before also claims that comments by the NI Executive Secretary Ken Atifwa that it is impossible to register Ghanaians who are yet to get their Ghana card in the near future makes the law unworkable. At present, statistics available suggest that at least about 2 million Ghanaians are yet to be issued the Ghana card. The registration process for the Ghana card has been characterized by several difficulties. The National Identification Authority has missed several deadlines to complete the registration of citizens. <laughs> Professor Kenatifa, Executive Director of the National Identification Authority, stated at a press conference last Friday, 16 September 2022, and I quote, we have the mandate to register all Ghanaians in Ghana and all Ghanaians abroad. There is no way NIA can register all Ghanaians in Ghana. If you look at our performance record, as stern as we believe our performance is, the reality is that there are approximately 2 million people age 15 years and above, who have not registered for the Ghana card. There is no way the National Identification Authority can register these, those people. Those people. It is physically 
technically and fiscally impossible, end of quote. We therefore found it strange that the Electoral Commission will call a press conference and urge the National Identification Authority to expedite action on registration. It obviously doesn't lie in the mouth of the EC to do so. In the circumstances, therefore, making the Ghana card the sole requirement for voter registration will serve to deny millions of Ghanaians their right to register and vote. Still staying on this development, the National Democratic Congress says if the EC does not abandon its plans to make the Ghana card the sole requirement to enroll onto the voters register, they will sue all lawful means, they will use all lawful means to resist the new CI. Since they're coming into office of the Akufuadu Baumia government, however, things have taken a dark turn and the time-tested use of consensus building and dialogue as tools for the management of Ghana electoral process has been supplanted by overt partisanship and impunity by the current leadership of the Electoral Commission. Since the po politically motivated and unconstitutional removal of the previous leadership of the Electoral Commission by President Akufuado and the convenient installation of MPP surrogates, Jean Mensah and Bosman Nasari at the helm of the Commission, consensus and dialogue have been, have been in very short supply. Disrespect and hostility by Jean Mensah and her charges at the EC towards the NDC and other parties deemed to be opposed to the current government have become the other of the day. Jimensa and Bosmansari have not hidden their intent and penchant for unreasonable and unjustifiable policies and measures aimed at furthering the interests of the MPP and the appointing authority, often to the disadvantage of the large sections of Guardians, especially those they believe are likely to vote against the MPP in elections. The alarm bells were set ringing when out of the blue and without any sound justification, the Electoral Commission decided to compile a needless new voters register only because President Kufuado and the MPP wanted it, having advertised their intentions long before they took power. The aim of that was to shore up the numbers of voters in MPP stronghold and suppress numbers in perceived NDC stronghold. Let's now turn our attention away from the National Democratic Congress and focus on other developments where a contractor who claims to have been owed by the Ghana Education Trust Fund has stormed the Queen of Peace Secondary School to lock the students and the tutors out of the school's Science and Home Economics Library Managing Director of Ancleco Enterprise Limited was awarded a contract to construct the Science and Home Econs Laboratory for the school in 2016, a contract he has executed in, he executed in December 2019. Joy News' is Upper West Regional Correspondent Rafik Salam reports that the students say the locking of the lab would affect the performance of the school in the next month's National Science and Mass Quiz competition. The Ghana Education Trust Fund in 2016, awarded at the Queen of Peace Senior High School to Uncle Co Enterprise Limited contract to construct this science and home economics laboratory. Construction works on the 1.5 million Ghana cities project, however, began in 2017 and finally executed and handed over to the school in December 2019. Managing Director of Uncle Co Enterprise Limited, Alaji Dauda Abdullah, said, after almost three years of completing the project, he is yet to be fully paid. Alaji Dauda said he has exhausted all channels of getting the remaining 800,000 Ghana cities paid. Hence, his decision to storm the school to lock out the students. The director is now a thing god. He's not ready to listen to anybody. He made a policy that he will not listen to any contractor. You go there, you are treated like a dog. You are not listening to. I've written letters to them appealing to them 
how my company is suffering, creditors are on me. For example, I took uh, about 500 uh, bags of cement from somebody to, pro to, to finish this project at a price of 34 Ghana cities. Now the, the price is over 70 cities. If I'm going to pay this man, how much am I going to pay him? His co company is collapsing, my company is collapsing, and all my workers are at home. So please, we have been pushed to the wall, and this is why we are taking this drastic measure. Regrettable, reg highly regrettable though, we, are, it's, we have seen, deem, we deem it fit and necessary for us to, to take this exercise because we have no other option. The decision of the lockout, according to him, has no political motive, but a contractor who is finding avenues for monies owed him to be paid to enable him to settle his debts. This is our first step. Push to the wall, you see the, the, the monkey attacking a dog. I think this is the first step. If things go ahead, we still have to go further. And if they go ahead to, to use the facility, it's illegal because I've come to officially lock the place, so I'm, I, I'm very sure if the government is listening, they, they will do the right thing by paying me for the place to open. That is my only appeal. Two practical lessons were ongoing when the contractor popped up at the school to lock the lab. So if you lock, it means you are locking the items too. Mm. But the contractor is saying that they haven't been paid for long. <laughs> Another was the head of science department, Yenli Ambayendetan. He says they are helpless. Yes, I personally was having some lessons with them. Yeah, we're having some lessons there. So, in the course of it, uh, the controller came and had to eject us out of it. And we are helpless. We are just helpless. The Queen of Peace Senior High School have qualified to take part in the National Science and Math competition. The only place that they depend on to do their lab test to learn more and to compete favorable in the national competition is this lab. And at the moment, they have been locked out. The National Science and Math School, we come here to practice every day. This is where we do our practice, and this is where the masters tell us, give us all the skills and techniques we need to do, and we learn everything. So if this is taken away from us, we will not be able to do our practice as well. And the students too, we have practicals to perform. For example, the chemistry lab, if we don't perform the practicals, and let's say what it comes, we don't know how to handle the solutions. For example, pipetting. Someone can mistakenly pipette acid inside, which is very dangerous. So if we start learning now, we can do, but since the lab is being taken away, I don't think like it will affect our academic performance. This science lab has done many things in our, uh, our lives. As science students, we come here to have our physics practicals, and every year, we, you all know that we write physics practicals, and if we don't practice, uh, uh, if we don't practice effectively, the practicals uh, is going to fail us. Their junior colleagues are equally worried about the lockout. Because most of our practical things, especially chemistry, physics. biology, the skeletal, this thing, no? like they are all kept in the lab. But with the help of the biology lab, we are able to, uh, to know how this, to know, to look at the structure of how like, the skeletal, this thing looks like. They have this special appeal to the government to pay the contractor to enable them use the laboratory. As the, the, as the popular saying goes, that practice makes man perfect. If we don't come here to practice regularly, we are just going to mess up. So we are appealing with the government that he should come to our aid and, and, uh, and appeal with the contractor that he should take away the locks so that we will be able to have our practice and our practicals uh, every day. Reporting for Joy News, Rafik Salam, Nadoli. <laughs>
The region recorded a total of 119 road traffic accidents within the first half of the year. And this includes 198 vehicles leading to the deaths of 60 passengers. This year, National Road Safety Authority, uh, in terms of road traffic uh, accident, uh, in the Bunu East region, recorded uh, about 119 cases. And it involved 198 uh, vehicles. That's the period from uh, January to July 2022. Yeah, so 198 uh, vehicles were involved in this uh, crashes. And out of that, 60 people lost their lives. And out of the 60 people, 20 of the deaths were caused by motorbikes and this Pragya uh, had these tricycles and others. He says even though the figures this year is an improvement compared to same period last year, more needs to be done to help reduce the carnage on our roads. It's not a good, but when you compare it to the previous year, I would say it's a little bit better than the previous year, but it's not good. We hope that by the end of the year, we'll be able to do more to reduce the carnage on our road. Mr. Champon Perry admonished passengers to contribute towards the campaign to reduce the numbers by speaking up as well as reporting careless drivers to the authority for necessary actions to be taken. If you're a passenger and you are in a vehicle, uh, we, we say, National Safety Authority say, speak up. Uh, when you see something that is not good or something, when something is going wrong in the vehicle that you are sitting in, make sure you speak up. You plead with the driver to do the right thing. So if you, you speak to the driver and still he or she is misbehaving, please, you can call the National Road Safety Authority. Our short code is 194. If you call 194, it will go direct to the National Road Safety Head Office. Then they will also direct it to the appropriate region or the location so that we can also take the necessary step. He again urged car owners to ensure that drivers have the requisite licenses before handing over their vehicles to them. A move, he said, will help minimize road accidents in the area. We request that they must, they must have a road safety or defensive driving training. And if you are a car owner and you are also giving your car to a driver, ensure that the driver has uh, the requisite license, the appropriate license. You know the categories of license and which one can drive which vehicle. So please make sure the driver has the requisite license before you hand over the car to that driver. Anna Sabit, Joy News, Tichiman. The absence of maternity blocks at healthcare facilities at the Kaobio and Nyokoko communities of the Bogatanga municipality in the Upper East region is forcing women there to deliver their babies in extremely difficult circumstances. Averagely, nearly 300 new deliveries are recorded in these two communities every year. But some of the babies die because the mothers either deliver on the way to the medical facilities outside the community or suffer some complications as a result of delays in getting their help. Is however on the way as the member of parliament for the Bogatanga uh, Central Constituency, Isaac Adongo, has initiated two mat maternity block projects for the community's correspondent. Albert Sorry now reports. Members of the Kalbino community here in the Bolgatanga municipality of the Upper East Region seek their health care services at this community-based health planning and services compound. The facility, according to health care officials, is too small to cater for the number of people seeking services here every day. It is even more precarious for pregnant mothers because the facility has no maternity block to cater for the over 200 mothers on the average who deliver new babies every year in this community. Matthias Kakano is the nurse in charge of the Calbino Healthcare Facility. Almost every month we have more than 30 deliveries more than 30 deliveries. But for the ANC, that one is just every day. The ANC attendance is every day. Because sometimes, because of work, the pregnant women, if we shadow them, sometimes they don't come the days we shadow them. So, in fact, we are facing a lot of challenges because the room we use for delivery is too small. It's too small. So sometimes after delivering, where the nursing mother should wait before recovering them, the discharge is a big challenge. 
The story is no different at the neighboring Nyokoko community. A small community-based health planning and services compound serves thousands of community members here. It is also without a maternity block, even though an average of 96 new deliveries are recorded every year in this community. This woman here has two children, both of whom were delivered on the road on her way to a healthcare facility outside of the community. I delivered two children on the road on the way to the health care center. It is because we have no maternity block here. When you are in labor, you have to be rushed to a clinic in another community. And if care is not taken, you will not even make it to the place. It puts you, the mother and the baby, at risk. So we really need the maternity block in this facility. Another mother here is not happy about the situation. We are here and if they take you to circle is uh, after there, some some the river in the house, some you you will not reach there. And if the clinic is here, it will help us. The nurse in charge of the Nyokoko Healthcare Facility, Patrick Sapakbun, says it is extremely difficult to manage maternity cases because of the absence of a maternity block. We have a midwife here, but due to lack of so many equipment for even delivering cell. After ANC, they have to go elsewhere and, do, and deliver. And that is a very difficult thing. A whole lot of the ANC service we deliver. Sometimes they want to give birth and then they end up even losing their child. There is, however, some hope for the women of Kalbion and Nyokoko. Two maternity block projects have been initiated by the Member of Parliament for Bolgatanga Central, Isaac Adongo. Each of the facilities, when completed, will have a three-bed capacity ward, an antenatal room, a delivery room, a recovery room, nurses' waiting area, and a store. A nurses' quarters is also being renovated in addition to the maternity block at Nyokoko. And no woman should die in the course of giving birth to life. And we have a responsibility uh, as leaders of the community to assist them to have safe delivery and family planning services. So that's the reason we have to put up these two uh, facilities. And uh, so that will be 200 for the two. I don't know how much the, the renovation of the, the nurses' quarters will cost, but that will depend on what the engineers come up to. And I'm funding this from my uh, share of the National Health Insurance Levy, which is about 65000 a year. But what I've done is that instead of dispensing the 65000 I accumulate up to a point where I can do something with it for free. The two facilities are expected to be completed and handed over in December this year. For Joy News, Albert Sorry, reporting from Nyokoko. That'll be all for the news. For more, log on to www.myjoyonline.com. My name is Pakwe Sishandov. The show continues with Benjamin and Mapitu CBD. Don't go anywhere. Stay. Welcome back on the AM show. It's a beautiful day. It's a holiday. It's a holiday. A working it's holiday. Yeah, but it's okay. That's fine. We serve you, you know, the fresh content. We want to serve you all the fresh content. Yeah. While you're sitting at home, you can watch our beautiful and handsome faces. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, for shizzle. Yeah. It's always good to, I, I look forward to the day when I'll be, I'll be, you know, 
on the other side, on the flip side, enjoying watching this. But even when I take my leave, usually <laughs> I just stay off TV and all of that and just have fun. But wherever you are, uh, thank you for making the time to join us this morning on the AM show. Of course, it's a big day in Kruma Memorial Day. This used to be founder, apostrophe S, day. Um, look, I consider the man Kwame Nkrumah. We all have opinions, right? I consider him the founder of our country and an amazing character who gave us our independence. That's not to say other people did not contribute, but look at China, look at other places. They all have their founders. Um, so, hey, we celebrate him today. We also joined uh, for the news review by Dr. Kwame Asante. Uh, he, of course, is with the Center for European Studies, the head of the Center for European Studies at the University of Ghana. A very good morning to you, Doc. Good morning, Ben, and good morning to my sister. Good morning. All right. Uh, we're going to try to work on the sound a bit so we can hear you uh, better. It is, it is okay. I heard what you said. I don't think it's from your end. But just as we celebrate, uh, we, we have this holiday. I just wanted us to go down memory lane just a little. And after I'm done, Doc, I'd like you to share with us your fondest memories historically of Kwame Nkrumah. So, Mapito, mm -hmm. you know, as legend has it, or maybe not legend, mm -hmm. um, as Nkrumah himself wrote in one of his uh, books, the day of his birth, which we, we've pegged at today, has always been a bit questionable. It was... Back then, they wouldn't note the exact day. Uh, it would be based on how many festivals had been held after your birth, so you were born around this time and all of that. So there have been so many theories about when Nkrumah was born. 1909 itself has been questioned. Uh, at a point, it was 1912. And as for the day in question, it's been problematic. It had to be synced with when a certain ship capsized, it had to be synced with when he was supposedly baptized and all of that. But yes, we celebrated today on the 21st day of uh, September. Do you know my favorite quote of Nkrumah's? Yes, yes. We face neither east nor west. We face forward. And this was around the time when, uh, you know, countries were committing to the Soviet Union, others to the United States and the rest of the Western countries. But back to you, Doc. What is your fondest memory of the man uh, we celebrate today, Kwame Nkrumah. What a question. <laughs> Nkrumah, as I have read him, was a great man, no doubt. He lived way beyond his contemporaries. There is absolutely no doubt about that. Such a great man, a man with vision, a man with ideas. Nkrumah thinks that we are grappling with today. He saw that even beyond before independence, or immediate after uh, independence. Nkrumah was such a visionary. Nkrumah did a lot for this country and for Africa that uh, today there is no doubt that his celebration, that his celebration of his birthday uh, is appropriate. Nkrumah, uh, if you look at Ghana, talk about Akoso Modam, talk about, talk about Tama Township and the harbor, Talk about uh, Temamoto Way, four three schools, uh, the list is endless. That is the man in Kroma. Free education system for the people of the North. Um, the need to have, you know, atomic energy because solar will be of a problem one day. Sorry, uh, hydro will be of a problem one day. So uh, that gave birth to what? Atomic energy, which today we have bastardized the place. Very unfortunate. Mm. Nkrumah sent people abroad for training. Had what that vision of developing the human resource of this country. The late engineer Wood is one of the products and a host of other scholars who today have done a lot in various ways to support this country. And Kroma's vision for this country was, you know, something that we admire all the time. His vision for education, mm -hmm. for industry, mm. for agriculture. Um, I think I cannot recount them. But when you read books about him, you get a full picture I'm talking about. Uh, his even beyond Ghana, 
is desire for Africans to have a continental union government, to have a standing army that will deal with crisis that will emerge. And we, play, we pay lip service to that. And we had our fingers bent when we had crisis and set up what ECOMOC. This vision uh, was Kwame Nkrumah's, and that was way back 1958. Mm. Nkrumah <clears throat> did a lot, a lot, a lot for this country. However, there were also problems. Yes. All right. Mm -hmm. Nkrumah, uh, having said all the good things that he did, also introduced the PDA, Preventive, Preventive Detention, Detention Act. Act. Right. Mm -hmm. You will be detained without trial. And this is Kwame Nkrumah, who believed that the British system was not the right one. It will corrupt him. So for that reason, he went to study in America, where there was democracy, where rule of law was upheld. Nkrumah would detain, Nkrumah's government would detain people without trial. It started with five years. Later, he extended it to 10 years. And that mm -hmm. saw the incarceration of Dangwa and Go, and unfortunately, Dangwa died in prison. I was a student of politics, undergraduate student, when Professor Sai told a story at the teacher's hall, how uh, he was a specialist, a physician specialist, and he had been called upon to come and look at Kobeche Vilamte, who was sick. And on his, when the man went there on his sick bed, he was chained. And he advised that the man, the chain should be removed and get pepper, uh, proper tre uh, treatment. Uh, Nkrumah was not happy with that. He was sent a few days or weeks. He was sent outside for training. When he came back, they could not find Obeche Bilamti. A very sad story. Mm. A very sad story today. Um, I'm not in a happy mood to say this because his family is hurt by that story already. But it is part of politics in Ghana. Uh, Nkrumah did not want criticisms because he said that it will bring back the, the, the clock of development, but that I disagree with respect, right? Because criticisms, as you and I know, are the oils that greased the wheel of governance, without which it grinds to a halt. So if you want to govern without criticisms, then I'm afraid you are likely to be confronted with problems. And indeed, Nkrumah was confronted with problems in later days of this year. Let us remember that Nkrumah's reign after independence, we had two sections. The, the first part of Nkrumah, uh, we call it, if you read Bob Fitch and Mary Oppenheimer, they talk about the first Nkrumah, 1960, 1957-1960. Uh, Nkrumah was a friend right. of the Western world, all right, and a darling to the Western world. He will go with everything of the West. But after uh, the Rhodesia affair, and then Nkrumah decided that from 1960 to 1966, Nkrumah turned an unrepented socialist and had all manner of problems associated with that. Uh, that decision that he would not even, uh, he described the Commonwealth, Commonwealth as a toothless bulldog. And then he did a lot of things that were weaknesses of Nkrumah were found in the second aspect of what? Uh, his reign. Oh. All right. Nkrumah would not allow criticisms. You recall 1958, he, there was a a youth conference in Accra, yeah, uh, African youth conference, and he said that his government was not going to countenance criticisms at all, mm. and that really was the last nail in the coffin of Nkrumah's administration. So, issue so, of propaganda mm. and all that was also rife in Nkrumah's administration. All right, you recall 1951 election, Nkrumah had said, uh, Nkrumah's a uh, CPP, not him as a person. Uh, that uh, Dankwa and Co had gone to take bribe to delay independence, which mm. was probably false. Mm. Nkrumah and Dankwa never took bribe. That was never the case, but that was used against him. And if you read the establishment, which Edubahim published, uh, that was a painful thing that Dankwa recounts all the time. Uh, there were a number of problems, but if you put, if I look at the balance sheet so well, the positives, the negatives. I believe that Nkrumah was such a great leader. He'd live way, way, way beyond his contemporary. I have no doubt in my mind. Mm. He was such a great leader. So interesting dynamics. Right before we get to Mapito with uh, the first paper, I just want to uh, run this by you. It's a good history lesson. 
uh, you've given us, but there are a few things to take out of there. There's no one who's perfect. Um, of course, and Nkrumah had his very negative sides as well. But you also look at the fact that there is this letter, I don't know whether you've ever spotted it, which also talks about, I think it was uh, J.B. Dankwa, Dr. J.B. Dankwa, and the, the tone, the tenor of that message then to the British authorities when it comes to independence and the fact that, you know, basically suggesting that it ought to be delayed, like you're saying. So whether bribes were taken or not, I don't know whether that, that followed the tenor of what ordinary Ghanaians wanted at the time. Because you remember that it, it was between two options, the UGCCs or the, the other group's um, independence within the shortest possible time, and Kwame Nkrumah's independence now. That is one thing. Then, uh, talking about his excesses, I mean, in other aspects, yes, you can uh, lay the blame squarely on his shoulders. But I feel when it comes to his paranoia, I'll call it that, at a point, you cannot take away what happened in Kulungungu. You cannot take away the numerous attempts uh, at, you know, taking his life. One time when one of his uh, police aides actually had to take a bullet for him. In fact, some say that it is one of these attempts, a grenade attempt, some say. There are so many theories about his death, whether he died from throat cancer or prostate cancer in, um, you know, Romania. But... There is that theory that one of those attacks, a grenade attack, uh, pellets were taken out of his body. And you know these can be contaminated, poisonous as well. But one lodged in his um, spine or in his backbone, that couldn't be taken out because if you go there, you automatically might kill the person. He had to carry that his, his entire life and that is what led to his cancer. So the point I'm making is that the Preventive Detention Act, the PDA, I feel on the back of human rights and everything was wrong. But what propelled the man to get there? The attempts on his life and some of the things that were, were done, I feel, were in very poor taste. And anybody, any leader, would be apprehensive. So it's quite a balance. But anyway, we celebrate him all the same. Uh, Doc, and uh, now yes. we, shall, we shall get into the uh, newspapers. Mapito CBD is here. Come in briefly. Let me come in briefly with okay, what sure. you said. There's no doubt that the attempts on his life were wrong, absolutely wrong. We condemn that. But does it mean that you want to have a draconian law? All right, put people for, before courts. Let them defend themselves and let the full rigor of the law take its course. That is what rule of law is about. All right. But when you detain people without trial, then uh, it's, it's, it beats my mind. It becomes a difficult because remember you have accused the British system of being corrupt and that and it's associated with some of these things. So you want to go to America and study, which indeed he did, and saw the booming rate of democracy and all that. Why did he come to do something different from what you saw? That is mm. my problem with him. Mm. All right. Because it doesn't matter the crime of every <clears throat> individual. The person must be arraigned before court and that person must have his day in court. And that is what was missing. And that is my criticism. All right, thank you so much, Doc. Now let's go to the Daily Guide, where the big story is another dead body found in Wa. 100,000 Ghana CD reward offered. We also have MP and 15 others in trouble over power theft and pastor in court for aiding six Chinese Gullam sayers. And we also have a fire, kills mother and kids. So let's take a look at another dead body found in Wam. So Daily Guide has oh. left. Uh, it's terrible, right? Uh, let me just read that. Uh, has been found in the um, Upper West Region. This yet to be identified dead body, which was buried in a shallow grave, was discovered around the new structure close to the Wa Municipal uh, Assembly. It is believed that the deceased was attacked in the early hours of yesterday. Some clothes believed to belong to the deceased were, however, burnt at the scene. This brings to three the number of security men who have been allegedly murdered in one within September 2022. But one suspect, Kankani Adongo, was arrested on September 19, 2022 in connection with the killings, and he's currently in police custody assisting with investigations. We also have on, um, still on page three, MP and 15 others in trouble over power theft. The Electricity Company of Ghana has issued a writ of summons to Ebenezer Tail Labi, Member of Parliament for Lower Manyakrobo in the Eastern Region. Now the MP has been arrested together with some 15 other persons for allegedly using power illegally. 
This was detected during a routine check on the company's meters at Pong and Odomase in the Kobo district by a team of engineers from the ECG and the military. The MP, the MP has denied the allegation, claiming it was a setup. All right, uh, giving details on how this was detected, um, she was mentioned that the MP sometime back reported the missing of two out of the <coughs> four meters on his compound. So that's on the MP and 15 others in trouble over power theft. We also have another dead body found in Wa. And the last story, which is quite interesting, is that a pastor in court for aiding six Chinese Gallim says. So now this is a man of God. Um, aiding six Chinese Gallim says. Let's take a look at that. So two Ghanaians have been dragged before an Accra High Court for contracting some Chinese nationals to undertake illegal mining, popularly known as Gallim say <coughs> in the Western region. The accused, Wilberforce, Sien and Reverend Wallace Della Brown, according to court documents, contracted the Chinese nationals and provided them with mining equipment to undertake mining on Reverend Della Brown's a concession without a license. Uh, Doc, from those headlines and a bit of those stories, what are your thoughts on that? MP and 15 others in trouble over, fifth, over, over power theft and another bo dead body found in Noir and a pastor in court for aiding six Chinese Gullum sayers. I'll start with the killings. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It's, it's a difficult thing to take. And it's a worrying story. And it's, it's happening where uh, we think that uh, it shouldn't be the case. Let me uh, take us back uh, to history. Mm -hmm. Growing, uh, when I was growing as a little boy, uh, there used to be a lot of such occurrences in this country. All right. And um, as children, you were even afraid at that point in time to go out somewhere to play and all that. Parents will give you all manner of advice uh, to be very careful and all that. Mm -hmm. But the security of this country stamp up this thing. And I commend them for that. Um, some years ago, we saw that in safety areas, killings, killings, the police rose up to the occasion and dealt with that. Um, in the Fourth Republic, uh, we've seen some of these things Mm. We can talk about the Tapradi girls, we can talk about other things and all that. And then our security also uh, dealt with that. It is unfortunate we are having this, but I know and I always have my trust with the security. They will deal with that. They would, it's just a matter of time mm -hmm. uh, because um, the police have to do that because of the social contract. Let us remember after creation, when we realized that our lives were in danger, we decided that let's have an entity or the state and it will protect us and we will obey that's why obedience to the state is compulsory so anything that undermines that contract then an individual who is part of the contract will then say that he will not obey the state for which reason the police will come in and restore that order i trust that let's give the police time to do their work they will surmount the issue and all of us will be fine but we as a public must also cooperate in helping them with information. Mm. All right. We should. It is a duty uh, that the Constitution and join all of us to do to supply police with accurate information to fight this battle mm -hmm. so that we end the story once and for all. All right. Another story that caught my attention uh, is on page three. And a jilted man commits suicide. So a 40-year-old man has committed suicide by drinking we decide after his wife left the marriage with his children over a misunderstanding. The unfortunate incident happened in the central region and reports said the deceased, whose name was only given as Sammy, had a quarrel with his wife, who subsequently left the marriage with the children. Brother of the deceased, uh, Jemfi Apia, who confirmed the sad news to Adom FM, explained that he had spoken with the deceased a night before the incident where he expressed displeasure about his wife's decision to walk out of the marriage. According to him, the next morning, as he was visiting the deceased, he met him in a pool of vomits and feces, lying helplessly. Uh, when inquired, the deceased confessed he had drunk poison to end his life due to the pain from the separation from his wife, and he was rushed to the hospital. However, he died 
on the way there. So meanwhile, the incident uh, has also been reported to the police as investigations begin. I think we need to, uh, we're talking about mental health earlier this uh, week mm -hmm. and how, you know, people don't talk about what they're going through. But what I've also noticed... Because we also have a society, especially for men, that makes you feel, oh, Bema so, Bema, some things, you know, for a man, so yeah. to speak. You shouldn't, you shouldn't show your emotions. You shouldn't be too emotional. You shouldn't this, you shouldn't that. And, and that's problematic. People keep in a lot and at a point they just explode. And the stats show that more men commit suicide yes. than, uh, than, than women. Yes. Doc, I mean, what are your thoughts on this? Is it the case that uh, men, there's too much pressure on them, the economy, they have to take care of the family? As a man, what would you say about this? It's unfortunate. It's a sad story that uh, people want to take their lives because there are difficulties and all that. We should, learning from uh, uh, clinical psychologists and then people who have also studied suicide and all that. Mm. My good friend, Professor um, uh, Psychology Head, the name doesn't come in uh, readily, but Professor Safo and co, they have educated us and continue to educate us on, you know, suicide and all that. That uh, we should, as a families, be listening to people mm. at workplaces, Let's get closer to people, even though we don't want to pry into their privacy, but sometimes it's necessary. And uh, when we are able to do this, we'll be able to alert those who matter in the fight in this area uh, to come to their aid. Mm. And of course, the state must also come in ready to assist in mental health. It is true that the state is doing its best, but it's not enough if you look at the resources given to them to fight this. And we should have constant education on this. Uh, once we do all these things, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll deal with some of these problems. But as a man, uh, I know that when you are heading a family, you don't want to fail and you don't want to see your children suffer and all that. Yeah. So you go length to protect them, support them and all that. And if you are not able to do this, that's where the trouble comes in. Mm -hmm. But I believe that um, we should be able to be sober, reflect, and do the hard thinking when we are faced with such realities. Because I always rely on Kwame Nkrumah's statement, organization decides everything. Once we are able to organize the very little <clears throat> that resources that we have and we ensure prudence, uh, we should be able to deal with some of this. Thing. Those beyond us, we should also develop the courage to share with people that we trust so that uh, they will proffer some advice for us. But once you want to keep it to yourself, if you don't take care, it will be a war against one and himself. And that war, nobody can help you. You will lose the battle. Right. Let's get into some other stories then, Mapito. Nkrumah Memorial Day, revived spirit of patriotism. That, uh, those are the speakers there. And Ghanaians must be inspired by the values espoused by the first president of the country, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, to put the country first before personal interest. I hope our leaders, past and present, are listening. Mm -hmm. Now, the five personalities who made the call in connection with the celebration of Kwame Nkrumah Memorial Day today said patriotism held the key to addressing the current challenges of the country. The personalities who spoke with the Daily Graphic are founder of the National Interest Movement, Dr. Abu Sakara Foster, the founder and general overseer of the Cooperative Fire Ministry, Apostle Godwin Lutheran Essie, uh, the director of academic affairs of the Ghana Armed Forces Command and Staff College, Professor Vladimir Inchidanso, a former director of the Institute of Local Government Studies, Dr. Esther Ofei Abwaje, and a former head of the civil service, W.K. Kemevo. And uh, they, they spoke profoundly about it, but I think it, it is summarized in that spirit of patriotism, mm -hmm. which I, I concede many Ghanaians today lack on the back of what they see, but it's also from the example set by our leaders, which um, makes a lot of them feel it is not worth dying for this country. Other countries uh, have citizens who are willing to put their lives on the line for them. If we are not ready to do the same, then how do we make Ghana great and strong? Uh, there's also Osajifu. There's a quote here from the Osajifu on page four of the Daily Graphic newspaper. Those who judge us merely by the heights we have achieved would do well to remember the depths from which we started. I feel that is uh, 
a poignant quote. But one thing that I, I, I you could reflect on what I have I've said so far about patriotism, but I want to stir up a very controversial subject, stir up the hornet's nest, so to speak. There's an opinion on page 10 by Elizabeth Ohene. I disagree with her sometimes, but on this one, I think I agree. Mm -hmm. She writes about lessons from the Queen's funeral, Queen Elizabeth II. And she talks about the fact that she passed on September 8, September 19, she was buried. You know, the swiftness. It's not now that we're going to have a oh, family meeting to even determine the date and the one week and all of that. Then this appeared to have been a very rehearsed, you know, affair, Mapito. Yeah. Uh, we are told that the Queen even had mentioned certain things, the hymn, where she wants to be buried, stuff like that. So it had been planned long before her demise. And another thing, just to mention a few, you didn't see them distributing any food packs, any drinks and all of that. I feel, and I am positing, that one of the most wasteful ventures, I know some people will completely disagree with me, mm -hmm. one of the most wasteful ventures, economically speaking, that we have in this country is how we go about our funerals. Even in the West, Americans and the rest, yes, there would be some, but small, simple. Here, it must be a whole grand affair. Same we're doing with marriage ceremonies and all of that. And I feel that is part of why we are bleeding economically. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your take is, uh, Doc. I have a lot to say. I have a lot to say in this area. Starting with funerals, I agree with you totally. That is a waste of everybody's time. That we spend so much time in organizing funeral for the dead. I have no doubt in my mind that we need to remember our dead. We need to, uh, you know, do our last, you know, pay our last respect for the dead. But uh, it calls for, you know, you know, reflection. Uh, how long do we want to do this? It should be a short time. We are done, mm -hmm. and whatever funeral we can organize, we organize within the shortest possible time. Issue of expenditure. Oh my God, you have hit the nail right on the head. Oh. It's a lot. It's a lot. And when it becomes a royal funeral, when it becomes uh, the funeral of a chief or a uh, Bishop Penning or somebody uh, with high status and all that, it becomes worse. Uh, we don't need that. A simple funeral, less expensive, is the way to go. And if we can take this advice, I think it will be better for all of us uh, because uh, what point is it in this when you organize an elaborate funeral, highly expensive and waste of everybody's time and you come back to start life afresh without even a penny in your pocket? It defeats the purpose for which you want to live as a human being. It doesn't pay. Uh, the painful aspect is that sometimes even the dead, the children, uh, what are they going to live on? Nobody has thought about that. Oh. And yet you have money to spend on funerals and all that. Issue of what? Takeaways in funerals. That is how we pass all food and all that. And you realize that even it takes away the very essence of what? Funerals. Where we mourn and all that. People are concentrating on. When are you mounting the buffet table? When are you sharing the takeaway and the drinks and all that? When I was a little boy. Funeral was organized, mm -hmm. and that time they had wikipings mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. they serve hacks, uh, you know, toffees. Uh, the highest you go is tea. That was introduced later, all right, and all that. No food, no food in the morning, nothing. Little alcohol, you are good to go, or drinks for women, so to speak. That's all, very simple. And we organize, we can go back and learn from our past and all that. Let me move on to the values of Nkrumah. And um, I can say, without fear of contradiction, that Nkrumah live and has left us with good values. Nkrumah, one thing I can say with, uh, with him is that he was never corrupt. Even though we saw all manner of accounts and attempt to ridicule him, uh, if you look at uh, some of the reports, uh, commissions that were set, and people came and then gave all manner of accounts about him in terms of corruption. Nkrumah was never, never corrupt. And so was Buzia. Nkrumah died, and up to date, I don't know whether he owned any property uh, that he calls his own, a house. His children will bear me out. Nkrumah never. Look at the head of state, all right, Nkrumah. 
Nkrumah did everything for the poor man. And what a way to cap it all off. Let me just uh, take a quick bite uh, to just nibble at a few stories. Nigeria makes biggest he ever was such cocaine. A good man. <clears throat> Pardon me. He did, a, he did right. a lot for this guy. Right. Who we'll celebrate him. Mm, yeah. mm. Indeed, we shall. Uh, Nigeria makes biggest ever cocaine seizure, story on page five, and uh, the Nigerian Drug Enforcement Agency says it has made what appears to be the biggest seizure of cocaine in the country's history, some 1.8 tons of cocaine, <clears throat> estimated to be worth more than uh, $278 million, that is the equivalent of 243 million pounds, were discovered in the warehouse in the Ikrodu area, northeast of the commercial hub, Lagos. Mapito, $278 million worth of cocaine. That is... <laughs> that is massive. That, that is... I mean, I don't even know. Uh, there are no superlatives to describe to it. describe e it. E over me. Yeah, e over you. E over me. Yo. Uh, there's also... Economy grows by 4.8%, according to the Ghana Statistical Service. That is our economy. Okay. The services sector was the largest sector of the Ghanaian economy in the second quarter of 2022, with a share of 45.8% of total productivity measured by GDP. Mm -hmm. And maybe to wrap, I don't know, we all know about the woes of the NTHC. Uh, on page 22, it says, NTHC under pressure, workers of Goyle threaten legal action for 30 million Ghana cities. Those are some of the major stories there. Uh, do you have any quick reaction before we move on, uh, Doc? Maybe yeah. very quickly. Um, ben, let me continue my story from Groma because... It has something to do for this country. Mm. Nkoma did a lot. Values, corruption, no. He uh, was selfless and all that. And not only Nkoma, Buzia. Up to date, nobody can point at Buzia's record that he was corrupt. And that's the spirit. Look at Lee Man, very great man. I visited his house at Nungwa. Very simple house, Lee Man. What are our leaders uh, doing today? Corruption all over. They are selfish. They want to destroy this country only for their families and friends. That is not good enough. And this is not what our leaders left for this country. They toil. They want everybody to succeed. And please, let's stay away from that. Mm. I see the passion with which you speak and you even had to take off your glasses uh, at a point. Well, let's check out some other papers as we... It's a holiday edition, so we're expanding a bit. Yeah. Uh, do you have any other papers? I don't have any other papers. Oh, so it's just the daily guide, guide that you have. Okay, so let me get into the Ghanaian Times then. Mother, two kids die in fire at Isuo Yeboa. Let's unite to fight Galamsey. Professor Drew Wusu uh, says so. And there's NDC rejects EC's proposed Ghana card as sole registration uh, document. Let me just look at uh, those stories very quickly. Very, very, very quickly. And uh, we shall continue out of here. So the NDC has rejected the EC's proposed Ghana card as a sole registration uh, document for purposes of registering uh, as a voter in public elections in the country. The opposition party held that the proposal by the election managerial body was, quote, unconstitutional because it served as a fetter or uh, an impediment on citizens rights to register and exercise their franchise that is that story mm -hmm. then on page 17 uh, professor odro wusu former vice chancellor of the university of ghana uh, has called for a united front if ghana would ever win the war against illegal mining and other vices that plague the country some people some uh, people of great consequence in this country that we've spoken to in recent times have said we've lost the fight and there's no way of return unless there is that political will. Your, your take, Doc, as we wrap. Uh, if you look at the Ghana card issue and then um, its appropriateness for election, I agree this is a good document. If you go to advanced democracies, you realize that some have only one, some have various cards that they use for election. If that's the direction we want to go, we need to slow, uh, you know, hasting slowly his thing slowly because you end up you know disenfranchising a lot of people especially where the fault doesn't come from them people want to have the cars but there are difficulties it is true that professor tifa and his people are working very hard to make sure that everybody gets the card but it's also true that we we we, we don't have uh, we don't have the cars readily uh, av available 
available for mm. the people to use. So if you want to rely on that as a single document that is used for registration and obviously to vote, then I'm afraid you want to disenfranchise people. Mm. So I support the call by the NDC that they should take a second look and then add other documents if you want to have what free and fair election. You see, one of the conditions for ensuring uh, uh, free and fair election is that you need a document that will help everybody who has reached the age of voting uh, to vote and then express his political uh, preference. You need that. You need that. And once people begin to have what difficulties or having problems, then they are going to question the ultimate results of the election. And that is not good for anybody. In elections, we have three phases. The pre-election phase, where registration and all these processes take place. You want to ensure that that place is solid. And then you move on to the election phase, where the activity takes place. There are things you need to do and do them right there. And then the last phase, where there's a declaration of election, you need to also make sure that your eyes are widely open and that you have done everything right. And that when people take you on, in terms of litigation and all that, you will have systems that will stand the test of time. I want the EC, yes, much as they want to introduce a lot of things, which I commend them, will help and then strengthen the frontiers of electoral processes in this country. They must hasten slowly so that they don't get the basics wrong. Otherwise, the whole effort of having, uh, having to what, boost the whole effort of electoral processes and electoral systems will come to naught. It's a simple and a harmless advice to them. They have to take it, mm. and it's compulsory. The good people demand that from them. Doc, uh, well said. Uh, t we'll be looking at that spe uh, specific issue uh, to do with the NDC, uh, for example, and what they're saying about the Ghana card, what the CPP thinks about it on uh, the show. Today also happens to be International Day of Peace. We'll be telling you a bit about that on the show as well. But Doc, we're immensely grateful that you took the time to join us. I am grateful. I'm grateful. And I want people to take a lot of cue from our leaders, especially those who let with exemplary lives. Because you can never build any society when we have people with crooked lives, mm. where people come and loot the state and all that. We should stand up using the law against those people and build a better society for ourselves. Uh, to all of you watching, uh, happy Nkrumah Memorial Day and a very happy birthday to Liz Hayfanasari, one of our panelists. Uh, she was here only yesterday. She's with the RTI Commission as a deputy uh, commissioner. Today happens to be your birthday, Liz. Happy, happy birthday to you. God richly bless you and keep you. Well, we have a package coming uh, your way. Uh, that's what we're going to be serving you in uh, sports. It has to do with, well, the Osei Palmer Discourse. There's more in sports up next. He did not win. Cat won. It's been three years since he came into the, uh, the FA. And uh, he's organized three congresses. Uh, and uh, I remember the recent one. Therefore, the second time you were at, even attending his congress, and you had reservations about uh, their financial statement. Certainly. Why? Uh, when you look at any financial statement of an institution, it speaks well or bad about that institution. And financial analysts will talk about the quality of the financial statement. Nabila, my kid who just started accounting, when you show balance sheet of a sole proprietor, the person will know that this firm is a sole proprietor. Because for sole proprietor, it's a capital, add profit, less drawings. That is how the uh, capital section is what is structured. So why is and it a problem? There's a problem. The problem here is that company limited by guarantee 
It's a company. So you go to the capital section of the company, limited by guarantee. Ab initial, it should be able to tell you that this is the uh, financial statement of a company, limited by guarantee. So your capital structure will tell you the type of company that you are. Are you with me? You go to the Ghana FA balance sheet and you have accumulated capital. There is nothing like accumulated capital in our uh, 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 2019 Act or Act 179, the previous one. There is nothing like accumulated capital. Those limited by shares, you have stated capital. And Ghana, instead of reserves, we do surplus. Are you getting it? So all these elements will have to show in the, on the balance sheet. When it shows on the balance sheet, the moment you take it, that balance sheet will inform you that this is the balance sheet of a company. So, so but we have accumulated fund. So if you have accumulated uh, fund, does that make the statement wrong? Does it mean that money uh, at the FA it, are it, not in the right order? No, right? about the quality of the financial statement that is being churned out. And I'll, 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 when I develop this, UEFA is a registered company limited by guarantee. Go and take their balance sheet, you'll see it. FIFA is a registered company limited by guarantee. And they are all non-profit. Go and take their financial statement. Then you will, you will understand what I'm telling you. Ghana Football Association is limited by guarantee. And also a non-profit making organ. Go and take our balance sheet. And you will see a complete dichotomy between what we are presenting and what they are presenting. So, so I want to understand. Even so if they present well, it wrongly, that no, doesn't listen, mean that there is something wrong. There is everything wrong because that accumulated fund could be used as a balancing figure. If the account fails to balance, they will use it as a balancing figure. But when you have association capital, as FIFA has described this, you go and check the financial statement. Yeah. Of, uh, FIFA will say association, uh, association is what? Capital. Add reserves. But it should have been association's capital, which will be consistent. Unless you have admitted new members and you have taken additional money from them. That is where the association's capital will change. But here, the accumulated fund has been altered. So check the FIFA one and you understand what that. When they talk of accumulated fund, it connotates operations of a, a, a firm that has engaged in what we call single entry. It means there are no proper books of records being kept at the FA. That is the signal. So you remember the auditors or Fred never touched on the accumulated fund. Because it's, it's untenable. So, it's not done. So it means that the FA, they, they don't keep proper accounts? It doesn't mean that, that there's something what, wrong with the listen, finances? That is the what the financial statement is suggesting. And I said, come off it. Because it doesn't give a good image of the FA. I spoke about the uh, uh, assets, especially building. Building yeah. appreciates yeah. in value. Yeah. So no matter how you bring uh, uh, the theoretical thing here and whatnot, it will not suffice. The fact of the matter is that you are declaring intangible asset of 12,700 and something Ghana cities. This is immaterial to be an asset. Meanwhile, your expenditure is more than the asset that you are declaring. So give the building what we call proper valuation. So you do revaluation. When you do the revaluation and you approach any investor, the investor will know that this uh, FE is of substance. Yeah. Because if you have asset worth uh, about 18 million uh, 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 Ghana cities or 18 million dollars, that person can give uh, money. the association money, money yeah. for us to operate. Go through the financial statement, and it's laughable. I saw Glow money being acknowledged as a revenue. I said, ah, how is that possible? It's not possible in accounting. Growth sponsorship happened some years back. Yeah. And in accounting, we have what we call it. Yeah, we, have, we have accrual concept. Whether you have received the money or you have not received the money, whether you have paid the expenditure or you have not paid, acknowledge that this sponsorship pertains to 2013 and not what? 20. Oh, so they shouldn't have added it to no, it's their current revenue. It's not part of your revenue.
how could that be part of so it simply means you are you are realizing uh, income on cash basis and you cannot do that who does that it's not done judgment debt as an expenditure how is it possible if i owe you and i come and pay is it an expense it's not an expense so all these point to the fact that we have quality issues with the with the financial statement that that, well, that was submitted to congress <laughs> mm. are, are you getting yeah, it yeah yeah okay uh let me quickly view off yeah. and talk about the budget president Kurt Okeku engaged in politics look at the president's what speech yes you have his uh, picture is it done I've never been to annual general meeting or a corporate environment where the president or the chief executive of the has his, his picture at a, at, as, a, as a cover. No, what, what, what is normally done is that first page, if the president is going to give the speech, uh, speech, they will put his passport copy at the first page, but not a cover page. This is not politics. He made a lot of statements. That is political. I suggest he can make politics. Why would you do politics with corporate governance? We are talking about sensitive issues that affect the operations of the FA. You brought a whole budget. There was no capital expenditure budget. Yet you say you are going to uh, acquire uh, pickups and give it to the RFEs. Where is it in the budget? They should show me where they have it in the budget. You say you are going to construct a whole technical center, make it anew change the, the 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 scope at ganaman where is it sitting in the budget nothing on capital expenditure so if this is not campaign what else can you uh, term this it's surely campaign look at their uh, budget and i will tell you mm -hmm. budget we have budgeting and budgetary control the process of budgeting is different from budgetary control are you getting it? You don't have to wait till the end of the year for you to know that your budget will not materialize. So what people do is that they will have a cash, uh, cash flow statement. Yeah, yeah. The cash flow statement is compartmentalized. You have either into quarters or into months. So that by the end of the month, the finance committee can go and sit and see if we are meeting targets. That is how come when the government of Ghana present its budget to parliament. There is a mid-year review. So there should be an avenue for the budget to be reviewed. But they have loved everything. You cannot uh, uh, see what is to be achieved. Incompetency at the FA? Oh, certainly if this is not incompetency, what else would I say? The budget portrays it, 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 it means that you were part of the team that went and appointed an incompetent auditor to manage the... the, the you voted. The, uh, you voted, yes. So if you were part I of I don't the have any problem with that. Majority carried the vote. So you, you appointed uh, an incompetent ed auditor to Bennett, manage your uh, affairs. Uh, the auditor. Yes. The auditor was, was imposed on us. How? Because oh. I was at that Congress. Check that Congress. It, we didn't appoint him. He was imposed on us. <laughs> they chose it. They chose the auditor. Go and read it. They chose him. <laughs> this is my chosen. They, they <laughs> uh, it became an issue. We, wow. didn't, we didn't choose him. No, 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 they didn't choose him. They say KPMG failed to uh, respond. Then another one, PWC. when you compare this, 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 and this, we, we would like to deal with this. Why is it that uh, but, but still you auditor could but, come and answer? But, but, still, but still, you approved it. They approved. It was approved. I was at that Congress. It was imposed. Just as he wanted to roller coast the uh, financial statement and the budget this year. And we go to a whole Congress sponsorship has been obtained by Ghana Football Association for clubs. Nobody has cited the agreement in the contract. But some of us who have been playing with figures, I can confidently tell you that that bear power sponsorship is not more than $1 million. <laughs> Why? Oh. Mm. It's not more than $1 million. <laughs> Just tell us. Why is it not more than $1 ah, million? How can you give me uh, $2 million? And you say activation is what? It's $1 million. Are you, are you going to capture that in your books? In your books, you can only declare one million dollars as the one as a sponsorship figure. In 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 accounting, we have allowable expenditure and 
uh, non-allowable expenditure. If it's advertising or promotion, it has to appear as promotion and advertising. You cannot learn that and say that that is part of sponsorship. So within the books or records of the FA, how much have we received for the sponsorship? And clubs are getting 25,000 cool like that out of $2 million? No. In the gross sponsorship that we had, $3 million was for the sponsorship. Activation was $3 million, but that wasn't part of the FA because, you see, you have to create a dustbin. That money has never been to the FA. But, but no. So why would you say that you are giving Apparently, the you've the not FA been fair to this FA. They've got so many sponsorships. Which one? Recently, they signed a deal with Flora. Just mention Bed Power. Now they are signing a deal with uh, Mara Metaverse. Uh, that cryptocurrency thing. <laughs> Is it a cryptocurrency oh, company? You go and sign an illegality and you say you have signed sponsorship. It's an illegality. SEC, SEC has pronounced, the Bank of Ghana has, they've also given their position on cryptocurrency. Why would you do that? That every sponsorship that is coming to the FA, there's a question mark on it. The same happened to the Macron deal. Then it metamorphosed into Tempo. We knew, some of us, we knew for a fact that we are buying our own boss. FA was using our own money, our money to buy balls for us. Yes, they say uh, Macron was giving a sponsorship. How is that possible? You're, you're kind of suggesting that there are so many wrongs at the FA. And, and um, I, 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 I don't really know what to make of it. If Before you sign a deal, you see, uh, uh, Nabila, as any leader, somebody asks me, why do you think you'll be a better leader? I say, one, the quality of the decision is very important. Then you surround yourself with quality people. I've forgotten the uh, management, uh, somebody who defined management, say, you are managing people. So if you have bad people following you, the kind of information or decision that you So Kat has bad followers. The quality is low. Kat has tell. bad followers. Uh, otherwise, why would you go and be dealing with cryptocurrency? And say, I've brought sponsorship. It's just like our uh, former headmaster who went and so would you half, want to replace the resource. Would you want to replace Kat as GFA president? We are not there yet. I'm not considered any political change in my fortunes. But if, if you're not there, uh, based on what Cass said... I'm hearing, he says, he will never clear me. Anybody who tells who me... Who never clear uh, you? Kate, anybody who tells me, I say, oh, tell him that I, I'm, I'm not subjected to his clearance or not. No. That is raising himself too much above a certain level. No. He should lower himself. Do you have issues with Kate? No, not at all. Have you ever fought him at an ESCO meeting? We have engaged in exchanges, but we still stopped it. You are going to fight? I ought, no, no. It means that you've had issues not, with him not for, for many years. So most of these things you are saying, people can that, just look at it and go like, no, there was a this report, man already has issues. There was a report that he vehemently kicked against it. And I, I was going to respond, and Kwesi stopped me. Well, he knew that what would come out of my mouth But the, the cars where they can, can get clear cars verdict because cars verdict also said that the normalization committee had the power to disqualify you Me. That, that yes but did they the did, 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 based did, on the things they raised can you point to any part of the report that is suggesting or implicating me that i cannot contest for future elections point to one no there's none it means that you are hopeful. You are hopeful that you can, you can, you can contest. I say I will never so next, impose myself the next elections, on people. The next election is 2023. If you are not contesting, do you want Kate? I, I, I will to support another candidate, not Kate. That one, uh, it, uh, any, somebody who will do such a thing to my club, now I'll go and support him. I will be a hypocrite to be doing that. Is that why you were part of the team that went and met in Kumasi and wanted to they change? Say, the they practice? say it's payback time. Who is paying who? Ah, for dreams. What happened to dreams? It's payback time. That's why they are doing all those things. I don't care. Football cannot put pecs to my progress. It's because you've made so much money from football. That's why you think. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> but as you said, I'm versatile. And I can always adapt and adjust to a different environment. No. Football cannot stop me. That is what he doesn't appreciate. Oh, you're good time, you good to my youth. We are going to collapse this club. Yeah, yeah, you know, by backing a false claim, 
somebody who has never trained a player. He should go to Cape Coast. Uh, but it, recently, you took the GFA to cast again. Yeah, we are there. How, you just mentioned the first one didn't go through. This one went through. How, how, how did that happen? But just a quick one. We just need to wrap up the conversation pretty quick on that one. Um, why are you dragging the FA to cast? Because they have asked you to pay some money to some club that also played a role in the... Ask football. anybody who is into football. How can a club that is not on the player passport claim that they've trained the boy at a particular point in the boy's career? The player passport determines those who have trained the player over the period. So how can anybody lay that claim? You appealed and you lost. So it means you have to pay. Which one? Uh, you appealed the decision of the, the GFA at and then that's why you went to CAS. Uh, I've not lost at CAS. No, I mean, I mean, you've not lost at CAS, but I'm just saying that you appealed the decision of the, of the FA. At the right? appeals level, at so the FA. In the first place, why don't you want to give them money? Because whether they play the role in yeah. or not, I mean, we, I, we, we all it, know Palmer to be generous. I no, remember no, no, no. prior to the FA elections, you were General, generous. Gen you were generous with $1 million. <laughs> <laughs> no. I don't think that generosity will... will you built a mosque in Bekwai. Or you, 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 assisted. you assisted in building yeah. the mosque. You, you, in fact, you gave money to uh, clubs, yeah, one women ten, clubs one, in one the ten, northern one ten, region. And so your generosity... Mm -hmm. it, it one thing about life is that anything that is directed towards the work of God contributes to your good time. I intend to even do more. Yeah, I intend to do more. My final, my final conversation, let's go to the World Cup. We are going to the World Cup. It's a national assignment. We wish the blasters very well. We know if the coaches are going to be meticulous in their selection process, Ghana abounds in talent that can at least get us out of the group. I'm sounding a reminder to the coaches that in any tournament, you are as good as your squad list. If your squad list is not good, or you pack it not on merit, then be prepared to come home early. So the coaches should give us a good squad, and the rest will fall in place. We should not go into this contest trying to just be part of the numbers. We should plan the World Cup so that we make an impact. Because I believe in the approach that we use the World Cup as a project to earn more revenue for the FA. That's why they are, they are securing sponsorship and you said they are dealing in illegality. No, the sponsorship, what FIFA will give you, no sponsorship. Can, can, give, can you give you that kind of, that money. Kind of yeah, money. That's about $12 million. So we'll get, yeah. to, get to quarterfinals, semifinals, and uh, the rest. But with Otado, Chris Hilton, George Boatin, GD Dramani, is, is it a possibility? I don't have any problem with the squad. A strong Man, technical yes, team? Yes, they, they are a strong technical team. But nobody should try and influence them to take a decision that will be challenged later. Influ try and influence them. W were you influencing the decision of player selection? The coach will have to come and rationalize why a given player has been chosen. So if the coaches are supposed to rationalize to the FA, is it a wrong we thing to do? We have heard comments from leadership and we know what is going on. Comments from who? Leadership. Who are the leadership? When somebody says, I told them to choose this person. Kurt is the leader of the FA, so if if <laughs> if if other members of the association does that, Odo Safu is part of the leadership at the FA. Yes, Randy Abe is part of leadership. Yes. Uh, Doctor Tonobo so is part of leadership. To, I'm not Samuel Enim Adam is part of the leadership. I'm not, I'm not referring to. Kurt. But do you also. think it is possible the person, that an the, the, the person said it to my hearing. influence the person said it to my hearing? What about if that person was just bad the, the FA for you? Uh, 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 if that, that yeah. person was just bad Martin, his leader for you. No, there is no speculation. No, but you're taking him hook, line, and sinker. Probably the person might have you see, when, a when, different interest. That's what the person When a building collapses, you don't have to ask whether the ceiling was part of it or the roof was part of it. The main building has collapsed. And you're asking, well, oh, the ceiling is not Huh? <laughs> so, this is a rhetorical question. My final question how far do you think we 
can go to the, at the World Cup? How far? We should be able to make it to semi-final. That is if you do the right things. What are they? Selection or merit. It's very important. Selection or merit. That's very quite important. That's quite if you want to go as far as you want in the FIFA World Cup. It's quite an exhaustive conversation with Wolfred Kweku or say. One interesting thing that I do not even touch on was um, about your decision to go and engage some people, some meeting in Kumasi to change the FA statues that they were going to change pyramid. Well, this was an extraordinary congress that we attended. So what has become and of those? What have become of those changes? At the appropriate you made? time we raise it. At the appropriate time, if somebody is trying to be disingenuous. Does it mean that doesn't mean that all the things you, you did matter, were not, have not been accepted? And that that is what it, of the it looks like. But who we, 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 we formulate another line of policy on that particular matter? Why are people trying to push Kurt out of his office before he's? They are not pushing him out of the office. We are just football is about regulations, so we are just trying to put the appropriate laws and regulations in place. And I don't think there is anything wrong. I heard you people tried impeaching him. Are you true? No, I will never do that. Okay. Yeah, he's a brother, and. I don't think I'll be part of any process that will impeach him. Hey, brother, you fight. Our brothers fight. <laughs> Even twins, twins, they fight. <laughs> Wolf Rekweko will say, our guest on this special conversation on the Join News channel. I am Muftar Nabila. Hello and welcome back to the AM show. Now let's go to our big story where the opposition National Democratic Congress is asking the Electoral Commission to abandon plans to make the gun card the sole requirement to get on the voters register. Now the NDC says the AC is seeking to rig the 2024 elections. Now we speak to the Convention People's Party for their take on this. Also remember that the CPP is celebrating Dr. Kwame Nkrumah by holding what it calls the true state of Ghana. We we'll hear from the officials of the party. Also today is International Day of Peace. This year's theme is End Racism, Build Peace. Now we have a conversation on ethnic, um, ethnic, ooh, ethnic <laughs> and nationality-based discrimination and the need for respect of human dignity. But first, let's go to the CPP and talk to the General Secretary, Nanayao. A champion uh, who is joining us uh, via Zoom. Good morning, Anel. All right, so let me go to our guests in studio, uh, Thomas uh, Ayupo. You'd have to help me with your pronunciation of your surname. Yes, it's uh, Thomas Awiapo. Awiapo. All right, and he's the executive secretary for <laughs> human development. Uh, Acting National Director for Characters Ghana, Coordinator of the CEO Peace Initiative Project. And we have uh, Mr. George Amo, yeah, and who's the Executive Secretary of the National Peace Council. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining me. Thank you, Thank you for having us here. All right, now, so this year's uh, theme is End Racism, uh, Build Peace. But now we're trying to uh, localize it. But before we localize it, I mean, let's talk about the broad um, spectrum of racism, right? Racism has, for example, as, as, as a South African, right, in 2022, I'm still experiencing racism, right? And I mean, 1994, President Nelson Mandela came and said, okay, you know, we're one, we're unity, we're unified. But still, in 2022, I'm still experiencing racism. What is the problem? Well, from my side, yeah. You know, racism is that sin yeah. that says that the other person, some people are inherently, uh, inherently more superior than others, and that some people are essentially inferior than others. Mm -hmm. And when you look at it in that way, just because of my color and skin and where I come from, mm -hmm. that it's, uh, we don't look at And when you want to localize that, you are coming down to what they call ethnicism, mm -hmm. tribalism, 
nepotism, mm -hmm. discrimination, and it leads to that. Yeah. But as I, I'm coming, I'm coming from the angle of the church, mm -hmm. and the church does not see that way. Okay. With the church, the church perception of that is that people are, you know, um, in the Gospels mm -hmm. or in the Bible, Galatians 3.28, it says that there is no Jew or Greek, no slave or free man. Yeah. There's no man or woman, but that we are all one yeah. in Christ. Okay. And given the same dignity and equality, as human beings. It doesn't matter your social, your economic, your political, your religious background, mm -hmm. but essentially that we are all human beings endowed with the same worth and mm -hmm. dignity as people. Okay. It doesn't matter where you come from. All right, so I'm going to take a quick uh, break and I'll be back uh, with you. I want to go to our phone lines and talk to uh, the General Secretary of the CPP, Nanayao. Uh, Juntao, and we want to, Nanaya, good morning. Good morning. Now, uh, what do you make of the NDC's position on, you know, the EC and the voters card? Hello? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes, so I want to know what do you make of the NDC's position uh, on the uh, EC and the voters registration? My dear, you know, we are celebrating Kwame Koma today. Mm-hmm. So if we are going on that angle, can we please do it later? Because we are already on the ground working. If uh, that's what we want us to talk about, can we do it later? All right, cool. So st talking about Kwame Nkrumah, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about you know, how to celebrate him. Yeah, good morning. Thank you very much. Um, this, today is the 21st of September. Mm -hmm. And today is Kwame Nkrumah's 113th birthday. Yeah. And we are celebrating him as an icon. We are celebrating him as a visionary, a selfless person who um, stood with his compatriots to get independence for this nation. Somebody who loved Ghana, who had a great vision for Ghana to move on. So today we are celebrating him to make sure that the whole world knows who he is. Already he is known. He said that Kwame Nkrumah never died. And that is why, after all these years, we still talk about him. Now, would you like to share your fondest memory of Kwame Nkrumah? I wasn't born when Kwame Nkrumah was alive, but I, I know about him through my father. My father and my uncle were the ministers of Kwame Nkrumah, and they also stood with Kwame Nkrumah to get independence for this nation. Mm. So, I mean, whoever, even he's so affectionate, he's so charismatic, that even when, you, if you never even met him, you would um, be affected by what he did for this nation. And for me, I live the story that I was told about him and how in my own home we revered him and had his pictures all over the place. And for everything that he has done today, we know what he did, comparing to governments that have come after him. And he deserves to be celebrated. All right. So you, uh, I'm looking at your poster here, and you're speaking on the true state of the nation of Ghana. Uh, what exactly will you be addressing? Please, we are going to. Uh, I mean, it, it will be good if you come here and listen to what we are going to say. If I preempt it at this time, then it means we don't have a program. Yeah, so but we are, we are going to talk about the state of the nation as it stands. And we all know what the nation is today. Our nation is in doldrums. It's not what Kwame Nkrumah left behind. But we give further details during the program. Well, we have some of our audience members who won't be able to make it, or maybe won't be... Uh, I can't hear listen. you, my dear. I'm saying we will have some of our audience members who won't be able to make it to your program. You so can you give us a gist of what you will be uh, discussing? I can't hear you. Your line is... All right. I'm saying if you can hear me... All right, it seems like we have uh, lost uh, Nanaya there. Let me come back to um, building peace and um, ending racism. All right, but now we're making it local and we're looking at, you know, there's a lot of tribalism and people fighting against each other. How, how, how do we end that? Yeah, sir. thank you once again and uh, good morning to uh, all those who are uh, watching uh, this uh, program. I, I think we have a lot we can do uh, to promote inclusiveness, 
mm -hmm. uh, to deal with the issues of, uh, you know, uh, tax on human dignity. Because when people feel that they are not included, they, their dignity, you know, freedoms, human rights, etc., have been abused or it's not being respected. Yeah. Then they have cause to do what sometimes they do. Yeah. You know, so all the disagreements in this life are all based on the fact that somebody thinks that the next person or the other group do not see me as part of the whole community. Mm -hmm. And for that matter, you know, uh, peace begins from within. And if somebody starts thinking that, no, this uh, Maps or Thomas uh, sees me as somebody destructive, somebody who does not belong, mm -hmm. then, you know, those things will start, you know, uh, happening in the mind. What should I do? There will be a conflict inside. And that conflict will obviously come out. And uh, that is why I think it's important the UN has set up, uh, I mean, this day. Uh, I think in 1981, the UN declared uh, 21st of each September, mm -hmm. you know, um, the International Day of Peace, uh, to draw attention to the need for all of us yeah. to acknowledge the fact that we belong to one common humanity. And for that matter, uh, uh, issues that divide us should be reduced as much as possible and help issues that bring us together. You know, such as, I mean, there are a lot of things yeah. uh, here in this country, in Africa, that should be able to pull us together than divide us. However, sometimes we allow very little minor things, you know, uh, to separate us and to create divisions. And out of that division, a lot of things can happen, you know, uh, violent conflicts, you know, we see it everywhere, you know. So, um, I think that is the core of the whole uh, issue. Um, we want to draw attention, the world wants to draw attention to the fact that uh, we need peace yeah. to develop. Without it, in fact, peace is the basis of all the human development. If you lose it, you cannot have education. You cannot have hospitals. Yeah. You can have the roads. We cannot sit here and interact as we are doing. You know, so it is very, very fundamental to any human development. Well, I like how you said that peace um, comes from within. This is, when we look at it, it's, it's an attitude thing. Um, how can we, like, you know, control it or manage it? Because it's an attitude thing. So how do we manage people's attitudes? How do we teach them? How do we educate them? What can we do? You know, I, I want to respond with a little story. Okay. You know, there was, in, during the time of the war in Sierra Leone and Liberia, there was this young man who was like a child soldier. Mm -hmm. But as young as 18, he had the rank of a brigadier. Okay. And then there was this journalist, very daring journalist, who made his way into that child, uh, children's uh, child soldier camp. Yeah. And he was interviewing this little boy. He asked him, how, did you, how on earth did you attain this rank at the age of 18? Yeah. And he said, you know, in this camp, it is not about how long you serve. Okay. It's, not how, how, it's not how old you have been, but it's how many people you kill. Mm -hmm. In a situation where people are motivated, empowered, and encouraged to kill. And you know, when, when, when war breaks out, we need to know the effects of that so that we can choose peace. And so I'm trying to say this because when, when elephants fight, Mm -hmm. It is the grass that suffers. suffers yeah. And when we fight, it is the most vulnerable who pay the price. Yeah. It is the women. It is the children. It is the most vulnerable. Yeah. And so I, for me, as I said, I just think that we, we, if we see ourselves as in the, you know, the Catholic Church talks about uh, uh, Catholic social teachings, the dignity and equality of every human person. Mm -hmm. It is endowed, you have it, you didn't earn it. They just put it there, in it. And it's not because of economic, social, religious status. You just have it and nobody can take it away from you. Yeah. And that brings us back to what he said about solidarity. That the human, we are interdependent, interconnected, and your survival, your very survival depends on my survival. And we need each other. That, you know, God, God shows no partiality. 
I wonder why we show partiality. Yeah. And we, you know, because it's a fabric. And I am in that little circle as Thomas. Mm -hmm. And then I have a family in the next circle. Then I have a community, I have a country, I have a world. And I cannot extricate myself from that. Mm. Neither can that remove itself from me. I need them, they need me. And so that is so important that we should think about yeah. solidarity, the dignity of the human person, and treat each other with respect and dignity. Now let's talk about the role of the church in peace building. <laughs> yes. You know, from the, the church, preaching peace and promoting peace is just a gospel mandate for the, Catholic, for the church, yeah. church as a whole. Yeah. Whether in and out of season, it is part of the gospel mandate to preach and promote peace. The, and, and, and the church has been involved in that. And the church is actually synonymous to Catholic Relief Services. Mm -hmm. And I know that the church, National Catholic Secretariat or the Bishop's Conference and all the churches, um, with the support of Catholic Relief Services, mm -hmm. are doing a lot in order to promote peace. And so, the, um, but you know, the church is a mandate to preach peace. But the church doesn't have it all. It doesn't have the expertise, all the expertise. Okay. It doesn't have all the tools, the resources. So then it calls for collaboration, uh, complementarity, and that we are all in this together, realizing that peace is good for all of us, and that with a concerted effort, with one voice, one platform, we can preach that. And you know, the, the, we, have a, we have a partnership with Catholic Relief Services right now yeah. with a project called the Sahil Peace Project. Okay. You know, with the, with the violent conflict in our countries, in our, in the, especially in the Sahil region, uh, the border countries and where people are actually motivated by, the, by greed, the greed for political supremacy, greed for religious supremacy, greed for economic supremacy to kill people. I mean, how can we ensure that there is peace, mm -hmm. social cohesion, and resilience of the people as we build together? So I, this project, this, and, and then they, they have a Catholic release of this project, the SPI project, is, mm -hmm. it says that they, they want to partner, partnership with Catholic uh, with the church. Because there's a theory of change that they believe if they empower the church and equip the church, because the church is everywhere. And when I say church, I mean Christianity. Yeah. Everywhere you go, to the, the biggest city, to the ends of the smallest place, you find the church where there are people. And so Catholic Relief Service believes that if they will empower the church and equip the church, and the church takes leadership and ownership of peace building, we will, they will be able to create that environment where we can live in peace and build so, social cohesion. Yeah. And then we become more resilient to all the shocks that we receive in the area of conflict. Mm -hmm. Because co for me, conflict, it's, it's, it, it's just, it just destroys everything. And when we talk about it, there's social, there's economic, economic war, there is social war, religious wars and all that. Mm -hmm. but we will not go anywhere with that. Yeah. We need to realize that our very existence and success and development depends on how we together commonly try to promote and build peace. So I'll come back to you for practical ways we can actually build peace. But sure. like, what about other stakeholders? Uh, what about other stakeholders? How can they build and maintain peace? Yeah, I think, uh, Mops, permit me to read something from... Um, uh, the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. Um, if you read Section 35, uh, Clause 5, uh, okay. it states, and I think it's very, very important um, from the directive principle of state policy. Uh, the state shall actively promote the integration of the peoples of Ghana and prohibit discrimination and prejudice on the grounds of place of origin, mm -hmm. circumstances of birth, ethnic origin, mm -hmm. gender or religion, creed or other beliefs. So the state um, has set an agenda mm -hmm. to forge integration among the peoples of this country. I think it is important that all of us, state agencies, 
the media, mm -hmm. civil society groups, all of us have a responsibility to ensure the integration of this country. You know, sometimes when you hear of somebody's name, mm -hmm. it is enough in this country to set a dividing line. Because, uh, yes, his name is this. Probably he's from here. Probably he's not from me. He's, you know, so these are some of the issues that I think as a people, our minds should be, you know, vetted to and try to do as the Constitution has, has requested that we all do. Mm. Let us integrate. Let us respect people, regardless of where they come from. And you know, the second point, circumstance of birth. Somebody, I mean, nobody decided how or the form you're going to be born. If you are born maimed, mm -hmm. if you are born I mean, blind, if you are born without legs, it wasn't your decision. And our Constitution, respectfully, is calling on all Ghanaians to respect people of that kind. But in reality, is that what's happening? Yes, that is why we have to do a lot of advocacy, myself and yourself, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean the media. We must all pull together and ensure that we integrate more and more. It cannot be an event. Yeah. It should be a, process, a deliberate process that we put in place to ensure we realize uh, Article 35.5 of the 1992 Constitution. It's very important. You know, when we're able to remove mistrust, because almost all the source of conflicts, I mean, in this life, they come because people do not trust that somebody is doing something right. You know, so if we're able to pull together, advocate, create awareness, mm. our educational institutions are able to imbibe in our children from the, from the early stages, the need to respect each other, regardless of where one comes from in this country, regardless of the language you speak, regardless of the kind of food. You know, when I was young, um, Maps, let me tell you, I eat snails a lot. Okay. Yes, snails. I don't know whether you also eat it. Not really. <laughs> but my culture, <laughs> you see, so if you, for example, see me eating snails, yeah. you may think, uh, this guy is, but that is my culture. Your culture, yeah. You see, if I see my brother Thomas here eating something different, if I'm not careful, that may be the basis or the grounds for discrimination. Mm. I don't like the thing he eats. Yeah. I don't like the hair cut. Mm. I don't like um, the way he's dressed. You know, so these are the things that all of us, and the peace council, I think we have a greater responsibility because we have been given the mandate you know, to develop mechanisms uh, and uh, all the, the, the other things to ensure we would prevent. You, would you like to share those mechanisms with us? Oh, yes. Um, a couple of them. One, we are expected to coordinate and harmonize. Okay. You know, um, all uh, peace actors in this country. Okay. And all peace initiatives. That is one mechanism we've been mandated to, to do. And uh, that's why I'm here with my brother from the Catholic Relief Services mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, the Catholic Secretariat. Indeed, the Peace Council itself is a microcosm of the, the nature of Ghanaians, the Ghanaian society. We have three Muslims, mm -hmm. we have four Christians, we have one person who is uh, from the you know, African traditional uh, religious faith, and we move together. Yeah. We sit together. We sometimes eat together. I think that is how the state, the constitution of this republic, want us to conduct our business. We must behave towards one another with mm -hmm. respect, you know, regardless of where one is coming from, regardless of the circumstances mm. that uh, maps you were born. We have to live together, respect each other, respect the language. You know, some languages are gradually being extinguished. Yeah. You know, yes. But why? Uh, there should be a deliberate state policy, for example, to promote such languages mm -hmm. so that they do not, you know, uh, die away. And uh, um, for even, uh, and I think it's, it's good in this country because most cases you find Ghanaian, a Ghanaian who speaks more than one language. Yeah. Yes. I think that is what we might be encouraging. And uh, Peace Council, uh, we, we do that quite a lot. We are trying to uh, enhance awareness raising across the country. Indeed, as we speak today, across the regions of this country, the Peace Council, our regional offices are all over the place, also marking uh, the International Day of Peace. Mm -hmm. And we have localized the, the theme. Yeah. 
we are saying we have to manage ethnicity, mm. you know, for enhanced diversity, you know. Uh, so that is what we are doing, and uh, we hope um, all of us must come uh -huh. on board uh, to ensure that we deepen our peacefulness okay. in this country. But it, okay, I'll, I'll come back to you because it sounds very like in theory it sounds very good, you know. <laughs> but like I asked uh, Thomas over here, is that practical? What are we doing? So I'll come back to you on that question. Practical, what? how can we build the peace? How can we maintain the peace? Well, <clears throat> you know, conflict is as old as the human race. Yeah. And conflict would always exist where there are human beings living together with different interests, different, um, different cultures and all that. Mm. But what is important is in our difference, in our diversity, can we, when we have disagreements, mm -hmm. can we actually sit together, dialogue and find the solutions to, because when people are fighting, when there is a conflict between the warring factions, that is where the causes, the, the, the root causes are. And they are the only people who can identify those root causes and find peace and harmony. And so the idea is how do you help conflicting, conflicting parties to bring them together? But when people are fighting, they hate each other. You have killed my person, you have destroyed my property, so I don't want to see you. So you are, you are apart. Mm. How can we bring people together to sit down? And how do you mediate that? Okay. And how do you bring them to down, uh, sit down and dialogue, through dialogue, find those solutions? And that is why one of the programs that we, uh, we are partnering with Catholic Relief Services mm -hmm. is the Sahil Peace Project. It is supposed to empower the church in the area to, so that they can improve, uh, di use dialogue and mediation to help people resolve their own issues and conflicts. Mm -hmm. And also, the, they are working through Catholic Relief Services, supporting the Catholic Church, because the Catholic Church has a lot of peace-building institutions. For instance, the Justice and Peace Commissions. Yeah. For instance, the Satellite Peace Centers okay. in all the parishes, in all the dioceses. They have all these people, but are they functional? Do they have the capacity the resources to do what they need to do to promote peace. This uh, Sahil Peace Project that uh, we are partnering with Catholic Relief Services is trying to empower the church to actually strengthen the capacities of all those peace building institutions yeah. at the national level, diocesan level, provincial level, to the parish level, to the community level, yeah. so that people will be able to sit together, look each other in the face and dialogue and get it done. Because it is said that communities, mm -hmm. communities that actually acknowledge conflict, identify conflict, acknowledge it, and sit down together to dialogue, grow. Yeah. Conversely, those communities that reject conflict and bury their heads when the conflict is there, mm. they die a natural death. You know, conflict, you know, sometimes it brings us to understand that mm -hmm. I am not alone. I need the other. Yeah. It's not either me or you. And, and so, and, and, and the issues of, uh, you know, um, emergency, like when people fight, mm -hmm. a lot of distractions. People are killed, poverty, hunger, no place, displaced. And when that happens, I, what do I have to lose? Mm -hmm. Then I can, I, I, I have to do anything that will mar the peace of the people. But so when there is emergency needs, humanitarian needs in, in, because of conflict, are we able to even support that? You know, lack of, lack of um, mechanisms and structures to support people who are suffering victims of conflict yeah. is in itself an issue of conflict. How can we establish some structures and systems to actually offer material and social, psychosocial support yeah. to those who are victims of conflict? All right, so I'll come back to you, gentlemen, in the mm. studio. Let me go to the phone lines. And Carolyn Rice, head of programs, Catholic Relief Services, uh, joins me via Zoom, actually. Good uh, morning, madam. Good morning. Now, we know violence thrives in vulnerability. So how do you use relief services to build uh, resilience in the communities? Thank you for, for the question. I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, build on uh, what was said previously. 
uh, and just to recognize the importance of this day, International Peace Day. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a day that was uh, created uh, for uh, humanity to really uh, commit to peace above all differences that we might have, as well as uh, to contribute to a, a culture of peace. And uh, something was said earlier that was quite striking uh, is that, uh, you know, we shouldn't be taking peace for granted. Yeah. Uh, Ghana is a relatively peaceful uh, country. Mm -hmm. um, but we are in a region that has seen an increasing uh, rise in uh, violent conflict. And so uh, at CRS, uh, in partnership with uh, the Catholic Church in Ghana and mm -hmm. in West Africa, as well as other partners like the National Peace Council, we are focusing a lot of our efforts in Ghana to uh, prevent uh, conflict, particularly through this Sahel Peace Initiative, which uh, Thomas mentioned uh, about. So I'll, I'll be happy to touch a little bit on that, but sure. beyond the... The Health Peace Initiative work, it's also about uh, ensuring that communities that are underserved, that are marginalized, have access to basic uh, and essential services, whether it's healthcare services, uh, water and sanitation, uh, emergency response, as you've mentioned. And so this has been really at the core of uh, CRS's work uh, in Ghana since we've um, uh, established ourselves here in 1958. So really, uh, rooted in Catholic social teaching and working to uh, address the, the needs and challenges that um, marginalized communities uh, face, particularly in, in, in northern Ghana, because some of those grievances can uh, easily be uh, exploited. Uh, and so uh, with that um, background in mind and also understanding that there are uh, conflicts uh, that take place in um, uh, targeted communities in northern Ghana, particularly around the border, uh, we're also uh, seeing uh, that there's a, a growing establishment of uh, armed groups in the northern part of the country that has allowed uh, uh, some of these groups to uh, uh, establish an active recruitment uh, strategy. Uh, so that really puts uh, the, the country at risk, although it is relatively uh, stable uh, today, and particularly puts young people at risk uh, because uh, the currently the youth uh, lack uh, access to um, uh, vocational uh, soft skills, mm -hmm. which prevents them from accessing uh, sustainable, dignified work as well as income. So that makes them vulnerable to manipulation. It makes them vulnerable to recruitment by violence extremist groups. So one area of focus has also been really targeting these young people age 15 to 35 and seeing how do we create, uh, how do we turn them into ambassadors for peace? How do we create these opportunities or foster these livelihood opportunities for them uh, to be engaged in and, and deter them from uh, engaging in violence extremist activities. And so at CRS, one of our core priorities is really youth empowerment, creating these livelihood opportunities, whether it's in the agricultural sector. And as I've said earlier, also uh, ensuring that marginalized communities, disadvantaged groups have access to key uh, uh, key services, key resources, whether it's water, which we know is going to be at the heart of a lot of conflict in future uh, years to come, uh, as it's a rare re uh, and uh, increasingly rare resource, as well as other uh, key um, services. But just coming back to the, uh, the Sahel Peace Initiative and mm -hmm. uh, your earlier question about what can be done, uh, it's important when we think of uh, this year's theme, which is uh, ending uh, racism, right, to, to really contextualize and localize that we have to really move away from, you know, the understanding of maybe uh, race as biology to really understanding and thinking of it as uh, the different processes, including historical colonial processes that have created uh, these notions of uh, differences or perceived differences. So mm -hmm. uh, we, we have to work on uh, tackling uh, and uh, these differences and creating a foster of a uh, of mutual understanding. So what can be done through the Sahel Peace Initiative, which uh, brings together five countries in the region. Uh, we have been promoting uh, various activities uh, that help different communities uh, get a better understanding of each other. It's, it's that lack of understanding that really leads to um, stereotypes, to prejudices, um, misinformed perceptions and divisions, which could easily be exploited and made worse uh, by fear or by hate speech, both uh, online and offline. So through the Sahel Peace Initiative, we are creating various opportunities. It's, it could be connector projects, uh, mm -hmm. doing joint community services, visitages to orphanages, cleanup activities, 
that provide that opportunity for, for people to come together, uh, to know each other better and build that mutual respect and understanding and to develop that sense of togetherness. Because as much as there's a very long tradition of uh, religious and ethnic diversity uh, in a lot of African countries, what we see is that there is still a common lack of understanding of the religious other uh, and the, relig uh, the, um, the ethnic other. So creating that platform, creating both forums, peace forums, both activities for people to come together, understand each other, as well as addressing the root causes uh, of some of these conflicts, as I've mentioned earlier, providing those uh, vocational skills training, mentorship and coaching for youth uh, yeah. to, to be uh, peace ambassadors is really critical. Now, like you rightly mentioned earlier, that Ghana is a peaceful country, right? And with um, the instability happening with countries bordering Ghana, what is your association doing to maintain uh, the peace in the country? Well, I, I, as I mentioned, the effort with the Sahel Peace Initiative in Ghana is really preventative, uh, ensuring that uh, the, the conflict that we are seeing in uh, the Sahelian uh, neighboring countries is not spill over. And so that looks at working critically uh, with a vulnerable and at-risk youth, really identifying those youth, particularly in uh, some of these border communities that are increasingly becoming a security hotspot, mm -hmm. hotspot working with them to uh, ensure that they have a livelihood opportunity. They are deterred from joining uh, uh, violent extremist groups. Mm -hmm. It's also uh, looking at uh, increased advocacy, which I know both uh, Thomas and Mr. Omar mentioned, but advocacy at the community level, uh, because different leaders within communities have an important risk, uh, important role, sorry, to play to, do, to increase, you know, social cohesion, ensuring that they're lending their voice to um, more harmony and less hostility, but also advocacy with uh, different stakeholders uh, nationally, um, it could be the security of Paris as well. For instance, uh, we know that uh, clashes between uh, maybe young people and sometimes uh, security of Paris could create grievances that uh, could further be exploited. So how do you create that uh, platform for dialogue between these various stakeholders uh, to do more advocacy to strengthen cohesion? If Ghana is strong and stakeholders in Ghana are strong and collaborate together, then uh, there, there is a good chance of deterring uh, this uh, violence from spilling over. All right, before I get your thoughts, your last thoughts on this, what more are we seeing going forward in terms of your association? In terms of the work that we will be doing in yeah. this space, we, as I, we're, we're looking at um, after the Sahel Peace Initiative, which we've implemented since 2019, in close collaboration with uh, the Catholic Church in Ghana. Uh, we, the focus was really working at the community level, uh, addressing uh, these issues that I've mentioned uh, in communities. What we're going to see more of is advocacy, uh, going away from this horizontal advocacy to now engaging more vertically with different stakeholders at the national level, bringing this to another platform, as, as well as raising awareness of the challenges that the Sahel region faces uh, at the continental level as well. And I think that the Catholic Church in West Africa plays a really key role in that regard, ensuring that everyone understands that what happens to the Sahel doesn't only affect the Sahel, it's a, it's a shared, shared challenge that we're all facing. And so it's important to raise that awareness um, uh, nationally and regionally, and that will be a, a growing area of focus for us in terms of our peace building work uh, also uh, strengthening the capacity of the church for the church to really position itself as a leader in that space and to engage with other faith-based organizations as well to do more advocacy. Uh, and just generally, we are continuing to um, uh, 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 intensify our work to address issues, uh, whether it's uh, you know improved wash or health or livelihood creation as well, particularly for youth, as I've mentioned earlier. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Carolyn Rice, who's the head of programs at the Catholic Relief Services. Uh, we want to say uh, congratulations on the good work done so far. Thank you so much for the opportunity. All right, let me come back to you, uh, George, and we're still talking about uh, practical ways yeah. how to build and maintain the peace. Yeah, thank you very much. I think um, we have a lot that we can do uh, to strengthen you know, our peacefulness. Uh, since 19... Uh, since 2019, Ghana has been ranked by the Global Peace Index 
as the most peaceful country in the sub-region. Uh, I think that we have to do some few things right. Okay. Um, there are structural issues that are really uh, depriving uh, some of our peoples, you know, uh, the joy of living in, in peace. Um, one, I think unemployment is, 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 is huge in this country. I think ESA's report um, indicates that over 200,000, you know, of our youth who graduate from our tertiary institutions, you know, when they come out, only 10% are able to find jobs. Mm. It's very difficult in such an environment, you know. Uh, so you see, uh, I mean, young, energetic uh, youth who are on the streets. I think that all of us, uh, the, the, the government and the businessmen, you know, uh, individuals, would have to create, I mean, uh, room for uh, job creation. Okay. I think it's important we do that to save the generation coming. Uh, if we fail to do that, we are going to have teaming youth who, are, who have very little to do or nothing at all to do. And um, I mean, the insurgents are all around us. And uh, I mean, we cannot afford, you know, to give out our youth to these activities. I think that is very key. I think the other thing we can do is, to, is for our, our chiefs, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, communities. I mean, in Ghana, you wouldn't go to any community without having a traditional ruler. I think secession plan yeah. must not be in doubt. Uh, every um, uh, chiefdom or kingdom, as some people may call it, yeah. would have to have a plan, you know, so that in the event that the person who is currently on the seat is no longer there, okay. the next in line should not be in doubt. In fact, that has been the, 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 the major issue of division, conflict, violent conflicts in most of our you know, uh, traditional areas. So I want to appeal to every traditional area in this country. We have something we, to do mm -hmm. to ensure we keep our traditional areas at peace. You know, if we're able to get that right, the secession thing right, I'm very confident that most of our communities, because most of the problems we have in this country uh, coming from, uh, unfortunately, our traditional areas. Yeah. You know, because uh, somebody who's not a royal, somebody who's not legitimate, want to, you know, uh, lay claim yeah. Yeah, to, to, and it creates a whole lot of, I think like, we have to deal that, with that very, very well and deliberately, decisively. I think, um, aside of that, discrimination, and I think the Constitution, uh, if you read the 35 6, mm -hmm. also states in clear terms the thing that we can do to integrate ourselves as a people. Uh, I mean, employment, I mean, should be one. If you are in an environment where you have just one particular uh, ethnic group, you know, uh, dominating, it creates unhealthy uh, problems in the office. Yeah. Yes. So uh, for us in the Peace Council, it's been a part of our policy, you know, to ensure we increase diversity, even among the staff of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the, of the council. It's important we do that. Um, even at home, uh, it is important parents also inculcate, you know, the virtues of love, of tolerance, you know, inclusiveness, coexistence. Christian Muslims leaders have a huge responsibility. We speak to people from different angles, you know, in our country. Uh, if, for example, my brother Thomas uh, is a priest mm -hmm. in a church where the president you know, comes to worship, when he says we should all stand, the president will stand. Yeah. You know, so the, the religious leaders in our, country, in our country have huge responsibility. They have influence. And if they are, they are, they are able to you know, uh, in, uh, consciously integrate the people, I'm very confident that we'll be able to address some of the difficulties we have. The church has a lot to do. The mosque have a lot to do. Yeah. Uh, let us together, you know, pull our peoples together, respect each other in our relationship. If somebody feels disrespected, it is the beginning of uh, you know, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. You see, so let us respect. I mean, let us learn from the other tribes, uh, the tribes we do not belong to. If it's possible, mm -hmm. let us even marry. 
Macross tribes. Okay. <laughs> it encourages us to, you know, understand what is happening on the other side. And we will live in tolerance, yeah. peaceful coexistence, mm -hmm. and Ghana. I think that peace is our biggest uh, investment. Selling point, yeah. If we lose that, if we lost everything. Okay. So we have a huge duty, not to ourselves alone, but to generations or more, mm -hmm. you know, to keep this country as much as possible in peace. Okay. We're able to do that, we'll go very, very far, I believe. So I hear you saying educate, teach, have a conversation, but on many occasions, the Peace Council has been, um, people have said that you are not proactive, you know, you are more reactive. Um, is this true? Is it false? And how do we uh, move forward from that? Yeah, I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's an opinion uh, in okay. the minds of people I cannot uh, contest easily. Okay. However, uh, we have been doing a lot of things. Uh, some of them uh, per our mandate. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't want to come out, you know, to uh, announce. Why? You know, you are dealing with sensitivities. Okay. For example, uh, let me use the issue between um, the NDC mm -hmm. and the EC. Uh -huh. I'm going to the IPAC. Mm -hmm. The Peace Council has been working behind the scenes to do a lot of work. Okay. You don't go out and say things. Then later on, uh, you may have to maybe do some Retract, dressing here. No? Yeah. You know, so we should be the last point of call. And uh, I would urge Ghanaians uh, to understand us. Uh, we are trying to do a lot by uh, educating our people that understand us. The Peace Council is not uh, a firefighting institution. Uh, we are not supposed to, you know, be making comments here and there all mm -hmm. the time. We would be, you know, uh, dousing our neutrality and our credibility. Mm -hmm. Give us a space. Let us interrogate issues a bit before we come out. Mm -hmm. So we come out with facts, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, when, 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 when all of us help the council to do uh, that and to work in that manner. I am very confident we are, we are going to, uh, you know, support the council to deliver uh, the expected expectations, you know, from our people. We have a lot of expectations are on us and we are trying gradually to meet them. But we have our challenges as well. I think, let me uh, leave it here then. Continue. Would you like to share some of your challenges so that people can understand, people with yes. opinions can understand, with these opinions can understand? Yeah, I think we need, for example, uh, we, we are not present in four out of the uh, 16 regions. Okay. We are trying to reach out to the places. Uh, we need office space. Uh, the Catholic Relief, uh, the Catholic Church has been very supportive. Mm -hmm. uh, some other institutions have been very supportive of the Peace Council. I think in Savannah, mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church uh, has given us a place. So, and, and in these four regions that you're, sorry to cut you, in these four regions that you're not there, um, how's the peace or the, the security uh, situation there? Yes. Is, is it like your absence, is it affecting the instability or the stability? It, it obviously would, would, would affect us because of, you know, uh, distance. Uh, you have to pick uh, early, early, early warning signs, etc. Okay. You need to be present. Uh -huh. you know, to do that. However, what we are, we are doing for the interim mm -hmm. is to get our, our regional offices closest to the place, mm -hmm. you know, to be in charge until such time that we are able to establish. Yeah. Uh, we are thinking that by the close of this year, we are going to uh, go to all the, uh, the, the 16 regions of this country. Indeed, the minister, my minister, Ambrose Derry, is really helping us okay. to achieve that. Um, apart from our presence, uh, we staff has been also been an issue. Okay. Yeah, we don't have the, the, the full complement of staff, you know, to be at all the places. Indeed, the law says we should be at all the, the districts mm -hmm. of this country. We are in only two sure. out of the 261 or so. You know, so uh, we are really handicapped. Uh, there are points that uh, instead of getting information, you know, uh, from your own people, you have to source it from elsewhere. Yeah. And that can, I mean, the credibility of Alta. that source, you know, yeah. you know. So these are some of the challenges we are going through. Uh, but we believe that with support of institutions such as uh, 
uh, our friends from the, the, the Catholic side, mm -hmm. uh, from Joy News, uh, we are able to reach out to as many Ghanaians as possible. Okay. My last question to you, because you mentioned the NDC. Uh, we know that the NDC has been saying that, you know, uh, the Ghana card, or he's been calling out to the EC and saying that the Ghana card will likely cause some sort of uh, disruption. You know, it's going to be a recipe for disaster. Elections to, are in two years. What are you guys doing to avoid possible clashes? Or will you wait, like other people are saying, for the, when we have the clashes, people are uh, dead, people are dying, and then you come out as the National Peace Council? No, we are engaging. Uh, for that one, mm -hmm. I know and I can assure you mm -hmm. and the good people of this country that uh, the Peace Council is engaging. Engaging. Yes, we are engaging. Uh, we've engaged the, the, we are engaging the EC, we are engaging the uh, National Democratic Congress at all levels. Uh, we are engaging the uh, New Patriotic Party as well. And even Nanaya Jantua, who just left uh, mm -hmm. a few moments back, we are engaging with the CPP as well. Okay. So uh, we are doing the engagements. But please allow us the space to do this engagement sometimes behind the scenes. Be okay. Helpful. And to such time that we've, we've achieved, uh, I mean, some compromise that can be confidently announced. Mm -hmm. I think I uh, understand the way the Peace Council works. So we hope that these engagements will yield some results. Yeah. Right, so let me come to you and take your, your, your last um, thoughts on this. In conclusion, how do we move forward? Well, in conclusion, um, you know, there's this... Uh, I saw it some two children, they were playing the war. Mm -hmm. I, they had these self-made guns. And, okay. and one would shoot and fall down, and the other one would shoot, and they were really playing a good game of the war, mm -hmm. how to play the war. Fast forward, I, I asked them what are they doing, they said they were playing the war. I said, oh, can you play the piece? Mm. And they are like, what is that? They don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. And I think that is all, we, it is conflict that is more emphasized. And sometimes even good things don't make it to the news sometimes. It is some, some of the negative things that are, so that's what they learn. Every day is war, is war. How do they learn peace? We need to teach peace to the children. Mm -hmm. Teach peace to the children. And I'm just saying, um, you know, war will never solve our problems. When we continue, it is the grass that suffers. Yeah. We are all one human family. We need to live together and respect each other, treat each other with dignity and respect. We are working, Catholic Relief has gave us this project, and we are working with border towns. How can we partner? Yeah. How can we have sister parishes across the borders? Mm -hmm. How can we let people know that there are ways to resolve conflict without having to take the gun and kill. And kill, yeah. There are alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, yeah. early warning systems. There are different ways we can resolve our issues without having to kill or to die. Mm -hmm. And, we, should, and we, we are working like right now through this project. We will be gathering over 30 uh, justice and peace and church leaders to uh, provide training through the uh, SPI mm -hmm. on uh, alternative conflict resolution, mm -hmm. early warning systems, how to identify that, and how to do arbitration. Because as I said earlier, mm -hmm. when people are fighting, actually the, 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 the causes are in within there, and the solution is there. Okay. It is just a matter of supporting and facilitating, creating a very conducive cordial environment for them to sit together mm -hmm. and dialogue and come out with the solutions. And you talk about partnership and that you will gather some 30 church leaders. Yeah. You know, that is what I heard, 30 yeah. church leaders. Yes. What about other leaders in other sectors, in other religious sectors? Well, we, as I, I had a picture that I wanted to show. Okay. Part of this same project sponsored by Catholic Relief Services partnered with the, the Catholic Church. The first thing we did was to have all the bishops' com uh, conference, the, one of the bishops' conferences for the whole year that happened in Accra here, mm -hmm. where, and the last day was dedicated to uh, Christian-Muslim dialogue. Okay. And that brought together the president of the Ghana Catholic Bishops' Conference and all the bishops, 
the chief imam Sharbutu, that's the first time I ever saw him. <laughs> Different Islamic leaders of, leaders of Islamic sects, mm -hmm. uh, pastors of different churches together. And I had a picture like that to show, but I can show it here right now. And it was interesting at the end of the day, a whole session on Christian Muslim dialogue. Mm. They had a beautiful picture. And you see all of them standing shoulder to shoulder, hand in hand, demonstrating that we can live in harmony. We can build the social cohesion. And so what is the strategy to you know, maintain this uh, social inclusion? Well, that's, um, that for right now, we have different projects, uh, different activities mm -hmm. planned for this project. How we are going, we are bringing parishes, border parishes together, border parishes across the country yeah. to bring them together and see how we can let them make friends, get to know each other. You know, you have children, I have children. We, what do we want our children to be? How can we make that possible? When there is conflict, we all suffer. We lose family, we lose children, they die, and we are, we are displaced. Yeah. All our hopes and aspirations gone. You know, you can develop, you can engage in development to the highest point. It just takes conflict to erode everything, all the gains and all that. So I actually making sure that people, I, all the points they made, the youth are roaming around, mm -hmm. no job. Millions, millions. And when you feel you have nothing to lose, a better cause problem so that we all lose. Yeah. We all go down together. How can we engage them? How can we teach the children in the schools about peace? All right, so I can hear you saying we're teaching the children, we're bringing church leaders together, but what do we tell the politicians and our leaders? <coughs> you know, because they're supposed to be the custodians of peace. But some may say that are the perpetrators of violence. But before you answer that question, I'm going to go to Caroline. Caroline, if you're still with me, do you have any last thoughts? Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, emphasize that point about uh, the importance of cross-cultural and cross-religious communication, mm -hmm. which is core at the, at the core of the Sahel Peace Initiative and all of the work that, that we do we at PRS. Yes, our work is uh, rooted in uh, Catholic social teaching, but we serve all communities irrespective of their race, their religion, their ethnicity, and it's solely based on uh, need. And there's a point you made that was very important, and I wanted to just touch on that, on the need to have inclusive dialogue. I think, as you've mentioned, uh, there is a, a need for a dialogue with a national government. Uh, right now at the table, uh, we have a, a representation of diverse stakeholders. Everyone has a role to play. Mm -hmm. Civil society particularly plays a very important role in holding uh, other institutions also accountable. And so how can we all come together uh, and uh, create a, an, inclusive, an inclusive space which is uh, you know, representative of a diversity of voices, men, and women. We know women are also uh, more vulnerable in times of conflict and are, their voices are not necessarily heard. So how do we bring both men and women? How do we bring youth? How do we bring persons with disabilities, marginalized religions, as well as ethnic identities in the countries? Everyone to come together, in addition to civil society, really dialoguing directly with other stakeholders, whether security forces, government um, organizations at different levels, to uh, promote that culture of uh, peace that is crucially needed. All right, thank you very much, Caroline, for that. Back to my question. Yes. Um, I have this, uh, this uh, there was once a story about uh, three greedy hunters. You are a very great storyteller. Yeah, I just three thought I greedy, should mention it. Yeah, three, thank you. Yeah. Three greedy hunters, they went hunting, the whole day they had nothing. And they were almost about to give up and go home. Mm -hmm. But then they found a big fat rat. And they said, this is our only chance. Mm. So they tried, they chased after it. But before they could get it, it, it entered a hole under the ground. And they started to dig after it. But before they, instead of finding a, a, a rat, they found a big box of gold. Mm. And they celebrated that. But they were hungry. Mm. So they asked two of them to stay there and watch over that gold so that one would go and buy food from the village for them to eat and share their gold. Mm -hmm. And he went to buy the food. And the two who, who were watching over the gold said, you know what? How about eliminating this one? 
so that the two of us can share this goal. Because then we'll be richer and we'll have more. Then we'll say, okay, how do we do it? Well, when he comes, we'll just lynch him, beat him to death. No cause, no reason. Then, well, he was also there buying the food and said, ah, how about getting rid of these people mm -hmm. and just taking the gold to myself? I'll be the richest in my community mm -hmm. and all that. Great idea, brilliant. But how do I do it? I will eat my share of the food. I will put deadly poison in this food. I will give it to them. Then I will achieve my goal. So, well, they all planned that and executed their plans successfully. Yeah. successfully. So they, he came. <coughs> they beat him to death. They sat down and ate the food. So in the end, you had three hunters mm -hmm. dead, lying al around a box of gold. There was nobody to share that gold. Yeah. Yeah. Our world is so consumed by greed. Mm -hmm. And until we can destroy greed, greed will destroy us. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying that in the church, Mother Teresa once said, God certainly created enough for all of us, for yeah. our needs, yeah. but not for our greed. Okay. And so for me, I just want to say that mm. we need to understand that. Because every atrocity, every war or conflict or that is happening, happening here, it is fed. It is about greed for either economic superiority or supremacy, greed for political supremacy, greed for whatever social status, mm -hmm. that is the, the root causes of our problems. <laughs> and I think until we can deal with that, we will, we will have no hope. Mm -hmm. And I pray that we can deal with it. Uh, George, any uh, message to our leaders? I think we have to celebrate our diversity. Okay. Uh, we have a lot we can share in common, a lot that unites us. Let us focus on those. Uh, those few ones that divide us, we can you know, play low on them. Let us hype the things that bring us together. I mean, we cannot all be, be um, uh, danger. I come from the central region. All of us cannot come from the place. Mm -hmm. It doesn't even help. It is good to see somebody, I mean, with a different something. It brings some spice in life. Yeah. Let us accept that we are different. Let us tolerate you know, the, our, our diversity, our differences. And that is the surest way of ensuring that we get this country together. Uh, we cannot allow ethnicity, I mean, where we come from, our place of origin, our circumstance of birth, you know, our gender, to divide us. I think Ghana has come a long way. Let us protect the peace we have for ourselves, for our children, and for our children's children. Mm -hmm. I think with that, um, whether we have gold or we have diamond, mm -hmm. I am confident that we are going to have the investment that we require. Because there are countries who do not have gold, yeah. who do not have diamond, mm -hmm. but they are more developed than we. Why? There is a reason. Probably they have allowed rights, human rights, um, peace, mm -hmm. and I mean, to take place. I think let us allow that. And I'm very sure Ghana will go places. Thank you so much, gentlemen. On that note, thank you so much. Uh, my guest this morning, uh, Thomas Oweopo, who's the Executive Secretary for Human Development, Acting National Director for Characters Ghana, Coordinator, Sahil Peace Initiative Project. We also had George Amo, who is the Executive Secretary of the National Peace Council. And joining me via Zoom was Caroline Rice, who is the Head of Programs Catholic Relief Services. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. You're still watching the AM show. We're going to take a quick breather. When we come back, uh, Benjamin Akapo will be sitting with Dr. Riku Bure on some issues. Stay tuned. It's a beautiful day, it's been a wet day today, but uh, we're uh, privileged to be in the home of uh, a politician, engineer, diplomat, businessman, 
we all fondly call him Tarzan or Tarzan, as many people would put it. Dr. Reko uh, Brobe is our guest today. Doc, thank you for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. For or, or better still, thank you for having us because we are here in your home. Uh, thanks for coming. It's uh, <laughs> a bit of a long way to come, but, uh, but we still I, found I our appreciate way. it. Right. Uh, especially as we're in this, these times and um, upon the demise of Queen Elizabeth II, who has reigned for 70 years, the, the second longest serving monarch in history after Louis the, the Sixth or so of France. Um, what would be your fond memories of, of the Queen, of blessed memory? Well, <clears throat> the thing with the Queen is that you're lucky if you get to meet her once in your lifetime. Mm. I, I was privileged to meet her in almost 40 years ago. Wow, almost 40 years ago. When I, when I worked for her uh, at the Commonwealth Secretariat, mm. you know, and um, every year we had a, a reception to mark Commonwealth's Day. And one, at one such reception, I was fortunate for the for Her Majesty to spot, stop and chat to me. And um, it was a very interesting chat. She's a very witty lady, very well informed. And we talked about her visit to Ghana in 1961 when I was a, wow. a small boy waving the flag that we used to stand by the roadside waving all the dignitaries. And she remembered the visit fondly. Uh, and I told her that I had actually started schooling in Kumasi at the Queen Elizabeth Day Nursery. So <laughs> I, I thought at any moment or any day, the owner of the school, who I presume was Queen Elizabeth, would show up. <laughs> but obviously, it took almost 30 odd years to, to meet her. But it was very good. But I think more than the fond memories, I think she had a um, major impact on the whole world, especially the common world. Mm. Don't forget, most of her reign coincided with the end of empire. Yes. The sun setting yes. on the British empire. And she managed the situation very well in which um, most of the nations that were gaining independence were electing to be republics. Indeed, all the African colonies, starting with our own Kwame Nkrumah, which became a republic in Sisti, mm. all of them elected to republics, but she wasn't perturbed by that because she still managed to persuade them to remain in the Commonwealth and expanded the Commonwealth into a nation which is mainly republics and its influence has grown so much that people who did not even have the benefit of being British colonies are now trying to join. And in yeah. fact, the last heads of government meeting, which we used to call Chogom, was held in Rwanda, which was one of the more recent members of the Commonwealth. But besides that, beyond the Commonwealth, everything, body in the world knew her as the Queen. I mean, the fact that over 100 heads of governments and heads of states and many of the great monarchs of the world are mourning her, have dropped everything on their calendars to be with her, mm. shows that she had a major influence on the, on the world. And so, um, one needs to acknowledge that. It wasn't just the longevity, but it was um, a reign that was perceived by all to have had a major influence. When Britain stopped becoming an empire, uh, the British Empire turned into a global empire now, which the Queen's soft power has made a very tiny country like Britain the center of the world in, in, in so far as constitutional monarchies are concerned. There are many monarchs all around the world, right? but I doubt that any monarch would attract the kind of funeral that Queen Elizabeth did. Mm. 
So a, a very interesting picture you paint, and especially as you started off mentioning 1961, when in fact she came to Ghana, came to had Ghana. that uh, yeah. dance, the first time she supposedly danced with an African it was a and very, all it was, of that. No, it was a very tense situation because, mm. um, you know, our first leader was leaning f towards the east. Yes. And also he was very vociferous in the anti-colonial liberation struggle and therefore there was a, a lot of tension as to whether this would mark the beginning of uh, a major rift, uh, a breakaway by the African countries uh, away from any ties with Britain. Mm -hmm. So in fact, there was a lot of tre tre trepidation when she was coming. And of course, she diffused the whole situation by not only coming, but dancing joyously with our leader in Kruma. And I think that, that must have had some influence in um, a recently uh, Republican country deciding to remain in the Commonwealth and setting the example where all African countries of the ex-colonies when they became independent, mm. became republics, but also remained in, chose to remain in the Commonwealth. Mm. Some have called that a masterstroke. But just to wrap on uh, the legacy of the Queen, some also say that, yes, I mean, there's no person without good and bad sides. Yeah, Everybody yeah. has mm. uh, both positive and negative. But some have said that she also superintended, you know, many negatives across the world, even as monarch, whether inherited or during her time from perpetuating, uh, you know, colonialism in some countries. I mean, South Africa, as late as the 90s, now, you know, you uh, late late uh, 80s, 90s, now earning its independence I, and all I, of that. Think, How do you react to that? I think we don't understand the role of constitutional monarchy in the UK. It's not the kind of situation that we have here where traditional rulers sometimes interfere in day-to-day -day politics, such as people ordering radio stations to be shut down or uh, summoning subjects to be punished outside the rule of law. A constitutional monarchy is such that you do not interfere mm. in the day-to-day -day politics that is going on. Because it's a ceremonial role. A, a, a very ceremonial role. Mm. And even uh, advice given in private must not be seen to be steering the direction of the constitutionally elected government. So I think it's a, a bit unfair to say that the, she stewarded over uh, unpleasant things. Mm. There's no doubt that the very murky history of slavery, colonialism, all of that, which of course we can lay at the door of monarchies all over Europe, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't, I don't think it would be fair to charge Elizabeth with that, with that uh, crime. If anything at all, she was one who tried to um, live with the realities of the current world and try to ensure, ensure that her governments would always want to uh, go down the march of progress. Mm. Well, let's move on from there, for, uh, you know, talking about the legacy of the Queen, and come to our own country, Ghana, and those we have to celebrate. Others, are, uh, many of us are celebrating the Queen, but how about uh, Dr. Ba Redu, Kujo Ba Redu, who himself has a legacy in this country. And since 2014, <coughs> we've been having the Ba Redu uh, lectures, and courtesy of the Ghana Institute for Public Policy Options and the Multimedia Group this year as well on the 22nd day of September, a day after Nkrumah Memorial Day, we'll be having another Bar Redu lecture. The theme, buying for the public good from the public purse. And you uh, are going to be hosting that event. Let's talk about, even before we come to this year's uh, event, let's talk about those in the previous years. What does it mean to have these Bar Redu lectures? I think um, the management of our public purse is perhaps the most important thing for all of us, be it government or being the people who governments are trying to serve. Um, political parties, and, uh, when they want power, make a lot of promises mm. without looking at whether 
uh, they can have the wherewithal to fulfill those promises. Right. And too often, uh, when, people, when political parties get into power, um, they tend to forget that you can't deliver on a promise unless you have the resources to do so. Exactly and so. they tend to uh, get into the exuberance of power over spending and spending money where really it, it is not necessary or desirable. Mm. And recently, I'm sure you have heard that <coughs> each time people need to do things, departments need to fulfill functions, um, you hear that they need clearance from the Ministry of Finance. Yes. Or, for example, we are pushing decentralization a lot in this country. But then how do you get decentralization when for more than five quarters, you know, for the last past five quarters, district assemblies have not had their uh, common funds. Yeah. So how do they deliver on the concept of decentralization? How do you ensure that, let's say, um, you want to uh, employ a lot of nurses, you know, then you have paid to be trained, you want to employ teachers, and then you find that there is no money. So the proper management of the public purse is perhaps the most fundamental thing that any government should concern itself with because it is important for it to be able to deliver on the promises that it, it, it made. And it's also uh, good for the people that you are uh, presiding over to know that the things that they think will improve their welfare <coughs> can be done because the withdrawal is there. And that is why, uh, you know, increasingly we are beginning to find that, yes, there are a lot of ministers and all of that kind of stuff, but every minister you talk to, they either tell you, well, we are waiting for clearance, or the Ministry of Finance has not released our money. And so we thought that we should focus on this public purse, mm. and especially when the incumbent president in his inaugural speech said protecting the public purse was going to one of his cardinal things. And, and, and so we must examine how our public purse is managed, where pro problems are, where uh, the resources get diverted, where they are used efficiently or inefficiently. And so each year we pick a theme which really has to do with uh, some aspect of public finance management, and then we get an expert or somebody who's got a handle on the subject mm. to come and uh, deliver and point out a few issues. Mm. And I'll, uh, we'll be getting into who and who are speaking at this year's mm. event, among other things. But just to reiterate uh, the theme, the full thing is buying for the public good from the public purse, yeah. redeeming Ghana's fiscal sanity in the mm. asylum of public financial reforms. Tell me, uh, Doc, wh when, you, when you look at the theme yeah. and you look at our current administration, what do you see when it, it comes well, to it's not just a buying for the public good, defending the public I, purse, I think, or I protecting think, it? You know, this is a, 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 an ac a academic way of putting the abuse of procurements. Mm. Because really, if you look at most of the more feasance and more practices that have gone on in our public finance management, it has, gone, it has all got to do with procurement breaches not following lay down rules and, and uh, cutting corners, finding ways and means. And so we thought that what we need to do is to examine. There are various ways in which um, things for the, for the public good are procured. And we need to examine what is the best way in which we can minimize infractions and people stealing money and trying to do away with practices which tend, at the end of the day, uh, to hurt the public finance as well as failing to deliver what it is intended to deliver. Mm. 
And so a, a telling statement, that, does this suppose redeeming Ghana's fiscal sanity, that we've lost it when it comes to uh, well, I mean, fiscal discipline? You are looking at the recently published Attorney General's report. Right. It came out with the, around 17 billion CDs of right. funds that could 17 be 17 plus billion Ghana plus. We are now just about to embark on a World Bank program, I mean, IMF program, to try and put some discipline to our economy and all of that. The amount that will be forthcoming to stabilize um, our economy probably is less than the 17 billion that uh, has been filched. <laughs> so, Really, that fiscal indiscipline, or you might call it stealing, mm. is something that if we had kept it in check, we may not even have had any need to go to IMF. We're talking about one year. We add cumulatively all those years, so that there isn't a single Lolita General's report that does not come out with so much that people are um, abusing. So the fiscal discipline has to be one of our major challenges if we are going to get a handle on governance. Mm. So interesting times. You also make mention of the Auditor General's report. And, yeah. and I want an, a very candid you know, assessment of, of that system because it appears from where some of us sit, it's, it's always reactionary rather than, you know, um, proactive and and it has been that way per the laid down regulations the law that it follows is it is it high time we took a look at that to, to prevent what you keep saying time no, in no. year in year out <clears throat> same uh, situation i think i think come at the hour come at the, the man i mean one of our previous lecturers was uh, <clears throat> daniel domelevo previous auditor general daniel yao domelevo right yeah I think the powers are there for the Auditor General and the uh, Attorney General mm. to exact the kind of punishments, and I wouldn't even call them punishments, uh, take actions to retrieve our money. Mm. And the irony of the whole thing is that when Daniel Yardemolevo tried to do that, then he was slapped by the very same executive from whom he was trying to retrieve um, misapplied money. And so it, it begs the question that are we, do we have a system where in fact too much power resides in the executive uh, in, in a way where he says if we don't like somebody who is going to get too close sails too close to our wind, we will step on their foot and hound them out of office. Um, you know, recently... Do you, do you feel Double Level was hounded out of office? Oh, absolutely. Of course he was hounded out of office. I mean, that, that's, it's very clear that um, he, he sailed close to the wind. He was tackling the executive for um, uh, abuse of the law and, you know, we have a situation where people who are semi, well into their 70s, close to 80, are having their contracts renewed. We have a situation of Delamovo at the age of 60 being physically thrown out and um, would have, in other dispensations or other situations, may have been given a pat on the back and asked to carry on. If you look at the current situation where um, <clears throat> the citizens group are trying to put... The um, citizens coalition, right. Yeah, are trying to put um, some kind of force on the current auditor general. Mm -hmm. I, I, for me, I think that, look, you are dealing with public servants. The current auditor general has seen his predecessor <laughs> completely handed out of office <laughs> because he tried to do his job. And he has been, quote, the beneficiary of the way in which the other one was treated. 
And I think that, you know, he may not have the bravery to say that, or to go down the same step that his predecessor went to. In fact, the very manner in which his predecessor was treated serves as a warning to him to say, look, watch your step. Mm. We are watching you, and if you come any close to trying to embarrass us, good, you go the same way. Are you so, suggesting Mr. Kwama may be, may be very much shaken, afraid of the not, consequences I'm, of, I'm not, of going down that I'm road? I'm not suggesting that at all. I mean, it's obvious that if somebody has been handed out so that you've been given the brief, mm. you're going to be very careful. I mean, he has been very professional in, 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 in identifying all the malfeasance and the inappropriate uh, use of money, but the action point, search and disallow, search and disallow. he wouldn't go down, route, down that route because if he did, he would be upsetting the very people, you know, whose previous actions put him in, in his current position. Um, I'm not saying that it's a good enough excuse for him not to act, but, you know, it's a once bitten, twice, twice shy. shy. Yeah. Right. So, so I think we need to um, look again at uh, the Auditor General's exercise and all of these things. Um, I believe that the Office of the Special Prosecutor was set up to deal with public corruption. Right. And in my view, my humble view, I think the functions of the uh, Special Prosecutor um, should be altered so that the Auditor General's report automatically is once it's been reviewed by Parliament, right. goes straight to the special prosecutor for them, in, in a sense, to look at it, investigate, and take the necessary action against anybody who, in the view of both the Auditor General and the special prosecutor, has infringed on the proper laws of um, procurement and other things, mm -hmm. and therefore needs to be prosecuted and also to have the funds they've stolen restored to the public purse. I think that might be a way in which people might be able to see a bit of action because I'm not sure that um, the current system is going to, you know, we've seen this now, well, um, we get into the 30th year of the Fourth Republic and yeah. We don't see very many We actually are in it. So 1992 you know. to 20. Well, 93. Four reports. More or less, yes. 93 starting. 7th of January 1993. 1993. So yeah. uh, maybe people should start thinking of that, of, of automatically giving the special prosecutor the power to, so that in tandem and in combination with the Auditor General, you know, they can work together and effect proper action. So th this is a very interesting development because usually when you speak to people about what more should we do, uh, it's more of, oh, search out and disallow. But this is a very interesting twist. You are saying we should alter the powers of the OSP, so to speak, yeah. so that once because the, the Auditor General's report is ready and goes through the parliamentary process, the OSP can take it, it up from there. It should be Fred, because the OSP, <coughs> are, their main beef is to look at corrupt, uh, corruption in, in, in public... Um, public officials. Mm. So I think adding this to that automatically um, gives the powers of prosecution and added to the Auditor General's powers of discovery and surcharging and disallowance. I think you may see something there. Uh, uh, one worry that comes to mind though, you know over time from Martin Amidu to uh, Kisiaja being logistical constraints, human resource constraints, and all of that. Looking at the bulk of what the Auditor General presents in the report, I mean, would, would the OSP have what it takes to deal with this? It, it, we could return to the point where it's been presented to you, but for years on end, you still have a backlog because you don't have what it takes to deal with, you know, with, with the situation. One of the things that we, we have, I mean, if you look at every ministry, <coughs> department, agency 
there's a big gap between budget allocation and actual disbursement. I think we want to fight corruption. We should be prepared to make the resources available. Uh, and if we have an, um, <clears throat> a success related support, can you imagine if the OSP and the Auditor General were able to recover, let's say, half of the 17 billion that has gone astray? Probably they wouldn't even need more than two or three billion to make their work succeed. Right. So the question of here we are seeing a lot of our money being wasted and we are crying about support. That uh, savings and uh, recouping the, the lost money, I think maybe you might build in some kind of incentives for those who mm. go after that and said, mm. hey, here is your success fee. We already have such a system with um, the revenue agencies. You know, they are set a target every year, mm. and if they meet that target, you know, a certain amount of um, the, the collected revenue, a set, a set percentage, is automatically provided to them plus a bonus. So incentivizing. So, yeah, yeah, you must. Yes, and it, it, it's an incentive that will pay for itself. You know, because you're going to try, and let's say 2021, 17 billion, you you, you manage to get even five, and you say, oh, let's give two or two billion of the five to the agencies that made it all possible. It can be done. It can be done. But you've already started broaching the subject of corruption. I just want us to take a quick look at uh, that. You made mention of what Mr. President said at his inauguration, what he said mm. about defending the public purse, and what he said even before that about fighting corruption. Yeah. Has the President, Nanado Danko Ekufuado, shown enough political will in the fight against corruption? Do we need political will or do we need action? Both. Uh, I think the, <clears throat> the action has got too many shortcomings. Because if you keep reading um, yearly, the Auditor General report, take that as uh, one example, <clears throat> the, the level of uh, misappropriation of public funds keeps rising by the year. Mm. So you don't need to be a rocket scientist to say that you cannot say you are succeeding if the situation gets worse and worse. Um, will, people may always have will, but the reality has to be borne out by the results of um, the stewardship. You talk about will must you know, reflect in something. There was a palpable, yeah, yeah. some palpable yeah. result uh, to show for it. This administration says it has done quite a lot in tackling uh, corruption. Is that to say you don't see what they see? You know, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. I'm a scientist by training. You deal with the results. Mm. You don't deal with perception. Mm. You don't deal with desires. You don't with deal with political wishes. You don't deal with political statements or goals. If you succeed, the success should be reflected in the reduction in corruption, reduction in pilfering, reduction in the uh, misappropriation of the public purse. That, for me, is what you need. You see, uh, you don't need to go out and tell everybody, I, I, I have, I'm, I have done this or I'm doing that. The same thing with the fight with Galamse, for example. I was just about to get Again, to that. Galamse. <laughs> you know, you, you can keep talking about, I mean, uh, last week I heard somebody talking about the government came out with a blueprint for fighting Galamse. 
Well, a blueprint that is not put on the road to actually fight right. doesn't take you very, very far. So there are a lot of uh, great noises being made. Um, it, it paints a good picture. <laughs> tend to convince your own that you are doing well. But, you know, we have a situation where I'm told, by, well, we are told by Bloomberg, for example, that up to 150,000 tons of our cocoa mm. are likely to be rejected mm. because <clears throat> they've been poisoned by the effects of illegal mining and, mm. the, and uh, Mercury, cyanide. Yeah, exactly. So, not only are we seeing, seeing the failure? It's not even beginning to affect our main economic activity. Mm. And um, uh, I, I, I really think that we, we are people that talk too much and not do enough. Mm. So the proof of the pudding, as they say, is in the eating. It's in the eating. So if you, if you want us to believe that you are really fighting corruption, mm. then let's see corruption going down in a realistic, palpable way so that people do not get uh, onto radio stations or the media or make a lot of noise about how we are fighting corruption. Let's see the results when you say that over the last few years, we have been able to eliminate corruption, so much of it, and we hope that over the next so and so years, we'll get the whole action stopped. But in a situation where it's getting worse, I don't think anybody can comfortably say they are fighting it well. Mm. And so the fight uh, continues. I just wanted a, a little sneak peek from you right before we get back to the uh, Bar Radio lecture and cap off the conversation. Mm. Uh, on, on the issue of Galamsey, I wanted to single out, take aside your legacy as a politician, as a businessman, as an engineer. Uh, when, when you look at the picture now, I, I listened um, to a conversation on our platform just a few days ago. This was Saturday, mm -hmm. and they were talking mm -hmm. about the fact that now, for farmers who, cocoa farmers who don't want to sell their farms to Galamseas, they dig around you and eventually polluting the land, and you have to sell. Some are saying, farmers are saying, they have to use sachet water to mix fertilizer and other, you know, inputs because the waters around them are polluted. It, tellingly, experts have told us that, look, Galam say if you, they use a parcel of land, maximum six months they are done with the land, and the land has nothing else to offer. Mm. But for the cocoa, it can serve us 70 years, 80 years, 90 years. Uh, what, what path are we on? Are we, are we on a very slippery slope with this if we don't get it right? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of attraction in getting... Gold has got a lot of value. Mm -hmm. And people kind of spend a lot of money to get at this value that gold presents. And I think for, you know, poor rural cocoa farmers, if somebody comes and says, and offers you a lot of money for your cocoa farm, uh, the lure is quite attractive. But I think, again, it behoves uh, government and the CMB, for example, to ensure that they do not put temptation in the way of cocoa farmers. Mm. They, they, they treat them well in, 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 in terms of the support and their livelihood and their families. You, you know, you, people don't realize that cocoa farmers, because of the way they are paid, automatically are paying about 30% income tax because they only paid about 70% of the FOB world price. So that automatically they are paying 30%. They need a lot more support that uh, make, make them see um, uh, long-term fortune in staying in the cocoa farm rather than the short-term thing of just selling up, taking a lot of money, which unfortunately will not last very long. There is a lot of um, work that governments 
if he wants to protect the country's economy um, in a sort of realistic, uh, systematic way, he must uh, come up with actions that um, are attractive to the cocoa farmers. Mm. Uh, uh, short of that, um, not only that, he must go hand in hand with taking action to stop Galamse. Mm. Because you know, unless you stop Galamse, um, ultimately, um, everybody, every farmer will have a price at which they will sell or be made to sell. Mm. You know, I, 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 I've been, I was listening to the story of some chief who is, who is digging gold in his bedroom. Yes, today we, we, we were actually you know, discussing on that, together with his brother. Yeah. So compound can, houses, and yes. they are digging right within the rooms. Yes, so you can see the attraction of gold. Mm. Let's go back to the Bar Radio lecture, and uh, we've already uh, painted a picture of what this year's theme is. Let me just reiterate, mm. buying for the public good from the public yeah. purse, yeah. redeeming Ghana's fiscal sanity in the asylum of public financial reforms. Tell us about, you've told us over the years what has happened. Tell us about the speakers this year and maybe <coughs> why them? Why Bright Simmons? Why Dr. Robert Ajay? Um, Bright Simmons, I'm sure uh, people, a lot of people who listen to um, programs such as News Night and Public Discourse. News File, yeah, on, among others. On the abuse of procurement practices know that he's probably one of the, the, the great um, technical experts in the area of the seeking our procurement. And I, I think over the years he's looked at a whole lot of um, things that government have done, either through direct procurement or indirect procurement through uh, contracts and the engagement of uh, expertise and consultants. And we thought that it'd be good for for us to bring all this experience that he has gathered over the years under under this theme, so that he can go through the exercise of telling us how best to do um, uh, the, the issue, how best to deal with the issue of the best use and the most efficient use of using public money to get what we need to get for ourselves. And um, I don't think you could actually get um, a, a, a better speaker in the area than, than, than Bright it's, it's on, on this subject. Mm. Um, we got um, Dr. Chairman, Dr. Ajay. Dr. Ajay, who is also um, an engineer turned chartered accountant um, who amongst his many things in life, he's now retired, was to be the chairman under, under President Kufos Tenner. He was the chair of the Central Tender Board, which you know yeah. is the board that reviews all procurement beyond uh, a certain value and has to ensure that the country gets value for money right. for these procurements. So in these two persons, we have got perhaps um, uh, two of the best in the field and what we tend to do with these lectures is that uh, once they have uh, exposed and given us uh, food for thought on some of these areas, we, we tend to put them into public discourse and try to see the way in which uh, we can use the knowledge that is gleaned in, in supporting um, the campaigns that the anti-coalition uh, groups in the country and others used to fight mm. and improve uh, our public delivery. Mm. What can we expect? You are hosting the event. It's coming off on the 22nd of September. What's the venue? Um, we are the Kofi Annan Peacekeeping <coughs> Centre. Um, the ICT Centre. The ICT Centre, yes. Right. We'll get, of course, there are two Kofi Annan Centres. <laughs> we, we are at Ridge and we are hoping. Unfortunately, one of the things that uh, COVID brought to us 
this whole thing of Zoom. Mm. And it made the people very lazy. But I think those who make it a point to attend the lecture in person will get a lot of benefits both in listening to Bright and also in the interaction that follows um, these lectures. And um, we would hope that um, we we'll, we'll have the packed hall. We will start at 4.30 and hope that um, by 5 o'clock we'll have the main speaker deliver the lecture and there will be maybe a half an hour of interaction, uh, a, a Q&A session, and we'll sum up and uh, hope that at the end of the day we would have made a little progress. Um, this will be the, I think, the sixth lecture that yeah. we, are, we are putting up. And so far, um, the f five previous ones have been eventful and given a lot of food for us to think about. Mm. And so you heard it uh, starting, well, 4.30, uh, participants would start arriving by five o'clock at the Kofi Annan uh, International well, ICT the Center. The lecture will start hopefully. at five o'clock. Yes, so I said people will be getting in yeah. at around five uh, o'clock. The, the speech or the main speaker would be delivering. Um, can, can anyone participate? Yeah, yeah, anybody can come. It's, it's, it's free, free for everybody. Okay. So you could be there if you opted uh, to do so. Any final words, uh, Dr. Rico Brovi? Yes, I mean, um, the reason why uh, we, we've established these lectures in Barredi's memory. You know, Barredi was uh, Kufo's uh, minister throughout the eight years of his tenure. Uh, he started off as education minister, became local government minister and then uh, in the second term of the Kofo administration he was finance minister until he died in office at the, almost at the end of uh, 2008. But for me if you look at the Third Republic he exemplifies the finest kind of public servants uh, who is served any sort of government mm. and his whole personality and service was seen by everybody as enormous sacrifice, humility, uh, diligence toward the work he was doing, no scandals to do with um, uh, trying to put his personal greed uh, ahead of the public good and um, the manner of his service, I think, really demonstrates the, the true meaning of the um, constitutional um, stipulation that uh, governance, governance is, is so that those we elect govern in our name for our welfare, mm. not the other way around. It's not an imperial um, democracy where the king is telling the mm. subjects what they want to do mm. or it's not a colonial system where the uh, governor general and their troops are telling us what we do. In a true republican public servants are working for us and I don't think and I think anybody who, who knew by radio who worked with him I had the privilege of working with him in the, um, his stint as finance minister, will attest that there's never been a better and finer example of a public servant uh, politician mm. in the third, in the Fourth Republic mm. that we are under, and um, in a country that uh, when people are no more give them a very big uh, send-off in terms of a grand funeral and quickly forget about them. Um, the few of us, principally myself and the current Minister of Security, um, Abe Kandapa, who incidentally I call my younger twin brother, 
because we were born on the same day and the same year in the same part, district of Ghana. We came up with the idea of establishing um, this series of lectures in, to honor the exemplary public service that Baradu had delivered to this country. And so we started in 2014 and um, we've been able to keep it going, you know. We didn't want to get caught up with the, uh, the normal Ghanaian thing of having an inaugural lecture and then everything ends from that. It never goes beyond that. Cool. So we we'll keep, we'll keep it going for as long as we're able to maintain public interest, as long as we need to ensure that um, people who we entrust with managing our public finances right. uh, uh, do so in a very, very genuinely, um, uh, shall we say, genuinely loving, responsible way, resp responsible, and um, um, I, I'm trying to <laughs> ensure that I don't say the wrong thing, but in a way that makes us all beneficial ben, ben, benefit from the use of our funds mm. so we'll keep it going and and i i think that it is been fitting so far that we are able to honor the memory of our reading mm. it's, it's been amazing interacting with you as he spoke about his humility just a very short story i've heard time and again it says uh, there was a list of ministers members of parliament were attending a function and there was this member of parliament who came and the lady noting down their names just wrote the person's name and he started throwing tantrums that hey why didn't you add horrible and all yeah, of that yeah, yeah. and then Baredu also comes in and he just writes Baredu. she's beginning to write and he says no 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 just write Baredu yes. and I guess that that, that is was testament to that, that was the man I, I've always kept that story in mind that, that in, in was my the mind. man I mean mm -hmm. he would come into the office and he you know he would just randomly walk into people's offices, have a chat with them. He was complete Mr. Humility. I, mean, I, I, I don't think anybody ever said anything bad about my radio. All they said was he was a hard worker and a dedicated public servant. And for me, um, I've been very, very, very happy that we've been able to sustain his name. In fact, one of the funny things was that um, he died in office at a time when um, having gone for treatment for an ailment, he had so much work with him that he didn't have time to uh, give himself a chance to recuperate properly. And that was, that was a very sad He died idea. serving his, his country. Yes. Yeah. That's precisely, that's precisely what happened. Mm. We're very grateful, Doc, that you've taken the time to join us today. Well, We're well, immensely grateful. grateful and, uh, I'm very grateful. We pray for the spirit, the, the fire, to keep on doing this. Um, well, I, I think we'll keep doing it. Uh, we, we're getting um, a few uh, people who are beginning to join and, and they see Mm. merit in the exercise so as long as we can breathe we will do it mm. hopefully after us others will take it up mm. dr charles Riku Brobe, uh engineer politician businessman a statesman if you like and he is host of uh this uh, 2022 bar radio lecture that is coming up 22nd of september at the kofi annan international uh, ict uh, center doc once more thank you so much And you're welcome back to the AM show just gone by is Benjamin Akakpo's conversation with Dr. Charles Rick yeah. And that was a very insightful conversation, uh, Benjamin. Yeah, with his pedigree and having been around for quite the while that he's been, 
uh, the talk about the AG's work, Auditor General's work, corruption, Galamsey, and all of that. And of course, the Bar Redu um, lecture yeah. series uh, yeah. coming up tomorrow, yeah. actually. Uh, interesting one there at the ICT Center of the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. But it's time now for us to take your calls. Uh, 0302 -611 extension 2 is the number to call. We have just about some six minutes. What are your thoughts on the International Day of Peace, on the NDC's take on the use of the Ghana card, both of which you have to speak about, mm -hmm. and then we can also talk about some of the, the, the matters developing from that conversation with Dr. Charles Rukubrobi. What are your thoughts? Do share with us. 0302 -611 extension 2. It's on your screens as well. So uh, talking about, I mean, today was celebrating Kwame Nkrumah. I mean, I don't have any fond memories mm. or any... Um, I wasn't maybe, born. Yeah, you, I wasn't you, you, born, you but, born, but, but you I come mean, to read, know about the person. Okay. So this is someone who's been calling us. This is like the third time this week that we're talking to this person, Abendao in Kumase. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Um, actually, today I'm very certain. Uh, I didn't want to greet you people, but if you have uh, any repeated as uh, responded. Okay, so... Um, uh huh. What's making yeah. you sad? I'm very sad because um, today we mark Memorial Day of Kwame Nkrumah, and when you look at um, the enormous development that Kwame Nkrumah brought to Ghana, and anyway, please uh, let me make this of my quote before uh, I continue with that. Uh, my quote uh, says that when anger controls people and they fail to recognize and appreciate what they have, there will be no progress. Yes, Kwan Nkoma brought about uh, enormous development considering the factories and the industry that he brought to Ghana. Mm. But people were angry at him, so when he was overthrown, everything, um, they turned it upside down. They collapsed everything, but it wasn't uh, his own pocket money. If those uh, factories and industries were maintained and a little were added in Ghana, where would we have been uh, in terms of development? So we know that uh, Nkoma had uh, errors with this uh, PDE, uh, um, among other things, uh, the constitutional development that uh, he wanted Ghana to be one party state and also trying to perpetuate himself uh, in power. Yes, we know that those things are errors, but upon all that, we should have also considered that, yes, that's his negative aspect. But what of the positive aspect that the development that he brought? So we, we could have considered, but because we were angry at him, we collapsed all the industry in the factories, and now where is the progress? So in fact, um, whenever I become sad, uh, I okay. do go and watch some of his uh, documentaries and what and what, but I become sad more. But I think that we have lost a great leader uh, who is irreplaceable. Throughout mm. the world, and come back to go to Europe and mm. everywhere and speak of his mind and his um, and his great ideas. Remind the books that he wrote. What are they? The All right. Thank you very well, much. I mean, no, uh, we're, we're grateful. Uh, you're asking where the books are that he wrote. A lot of them are available. There's this place I think in the Kwame Nkrumah Circle where mm. uh, you can get. They are rare though. You can't find so many of them. I I I am. I would call myself privileged to have. A few, a few of them. And, you know, Nkrumah reminds me of the philosopher king, a la what the Greek city-states mm -hmm. had back then. They felt the, the leader had to be a philosopher, a, a thinker, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And he was that. He was that. When you look at his writings, when you look at his plan, when you look at what he brought to bear in Ghana. Unfortunately, and I say this without fear or favor, we haven't had such thinking, very philosophical, you know, leaders in quite a while. Um, only time will tell when we'll get another uh, like Nkrumah. But we have other callers, Mapito. Let's go to Michael in Tama. Good morning, Michael. Yeah, Mapito. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm okay, thank you. How are you? Wonderful. I'm doing great. Uh, my question is, uh, in fact, uh, when Kwame Nkrumah made a statement that uh, the black man is capable of managing his own affairs, mm -hmm. I wonder whether he, he alone carried that vision. Because as we speak today, we can't see 
that we I, I don't understand and we cannot see that particular aspect of the black man managing his own affairs. Common currency we cannot manage. Akufado cannot manage. Common currency you cannot fight it. So where is the black man capable of managing his own affairs? Let me let me ask you a quick question. Quick question. Uh, what's your name again? Michael. Michael. Are you in your family setting, in your own life? Are you capable yes, of managing yes, your own affairs? Yes. Yes. Are you capable of managing your own affairs as a family man, I think? As, yeah, that is domestic, of yes. course. Yes, so if you are, it means that we are capable of doing it. We've just not got so the right people to do it. our leaders cannot do it? Mm. How come our leaders cannot do it? Are we doing it? Mm. Common galancy, common galancy, not terrorism. I'm not talking about terrorism. So assuming it's terrorism, then we are all finished. Come on, Galancy. And we are wasting, spending our money. They are spending our taxpayers' money, buying fuel for military. And it's a charade. We all know it's a charade. What they are doing is a charade. They are not fighting it. They are protecting them, rather. Come on. It's very bad. So where are we managing our own affairs? Thank you, Michael, for sharing uh, your thoughts. I feel his pain, and um, <clears throat> it's something I reflect Oftentimes in my blunt thoughts and others, it, it makes no sense, absolutely no sense where we are as a country. But, and even as a continent, by and large, you look at what we have, resources, yeah. look at the DRC. I mean, they can be the breadbasket of our, our entire you know, continent, the world. Mm -hmm. But look at, that, look at them, look at us here in Ghana. It's a terrible state. Mm -hmm. Look at us in South Africa. Uh, we're currently experiencing load shedding what you'd call dumso mm. in Ghana, like so often and so mm. frequent, it's becoming unbearable. Uh, businesses are suffering, yeah. you know, homes are suffering because I yeah. mean, if for eight hours your lights are <clears throat> off and maybe another four hours your lights are on, it, it becomes like- it's so really erratic. Difficult. Yeah, it's so difficult uh, to run your business in a state or in a country like that uh, when you're experiencing, um, you know, uh, load shedding. but. It's time to take our destiny into our own hands as a country. We need to come together to help our farmers buy the fertilizer they need. Otherwise, we risk a food shortage soon in the country. Farmer Line is supporting farmers by making affordable fertilizer available to farmers through a discount program. We're inviting you to also support us by donating 10 Ghana cities or more towards raising 1 million cities to support over 25,000 farmers this season. Simply dial star 887 star 444 hash. So that's star 887 star 444 hash to donate. Donate 10 Ghana cities or more and contribute to food security in Ghana. Benjamin, how about treating your family? Well, how's it? How about treating your family to a summer holiday in South Africa? Africa. Come journey to South Africa for a good time in our beautiful country. Get to know the locals and our languages. And if you're looking to let your hair down, I don't have so much. And relax or you're just in the mood for some fun, family-friendly adventures. South Africa has everything you need. This summer was Anila. Come this side and experience a holiday worth talking about. And on that note, well, we're going to wrap uh, right here. And of course, uh, Joy News Desk will be following... Mm -hmm. And tomorrow, you'll see us right here in Living Color, delivering the usual, the best on the AM show. Let me seize this opportunity to wish Liz Hayfranasari a happy birthday one more time. Well, on that note, uh, Benjamin, it's been wonderful doing the holiday edition of the AM show with you. Happy, um, happy Nkrumah Memorial Day to you, or should I say happy Founders Day to you? Please, we have changed it. Sir. Yes, we have changed it. Oh, really? You, people, you don't, Montiana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have changed it. It's not Father's uh, Day again. Oh. oh, it's Nkrumah Memorial Day. They didn't tell you. Ah, I didn't get the memo. Hey, I, Benjamin. I, I didn't get the memo. Uh, I didn't get the memo. They'll deal with you all. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, thank you so much for watching and tuning into the AM show. Remember to check, oh, join us tomorrow, same time, same place. I am Benjamin Akakpo. And I am Mapito Sibiri. And up next day. is Parkway C. Shandoff with News Desk.